Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Jackson Public Schools District regular meeting of the Board of Trustees for June 20th, 2017. Uh, thank you very much for being here this evening. Our first order of business uh, will be um, the Pledge of Allegiance from the high school division. Uh, Dr. Stanton will introduce our student. Good afternoon, members of the board. Dr. No. Murray, we're pleased to present our students from Callaway High School, and we have our academy coach that's going to do the introduction okay. of the student. All right. Good evening, my name is Tasha Viverett and I'm the Academy Coach at Callaway High School. Um, Avery Jackson is the son of Avery and Phoebe Jackson. He is an upcoming senior at Callaway High School. He is a member of the marching band, Callaway Choir, and the baseball team. Avery attends New Hope Missionary Baptist Church where he is a part of the youth ministry. Avery Jackson. Thank Can you. everyone please stand for the pledge of allegiance? I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Avery. Would you stay there for a second, please? It's the wrong person. Avery, we have a certificate for you that we will get to you a little later. We had a, another student name on it, so we'll get the appropriate one for you. Thank you very much. So just hold up a second. We'll change it. Okay. Could I ask that we invite her back? Because I think she's actually here. If it's oh. for Miss Ford, is that the name on there? Yes, Kelsey. Yeah, she's here. So I would suggest that we invite her back, too. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, for our, your next meeting, we didn't realize she was here. Ms. Ford, would you stand, please? please. Yes. What has she already? She's going to come back. No, she's going to come back. Uh-uh. She'll, we'll give okay. it to you. We'd ask you to come back for our next uh, board meeting, Ms. Ford. Uh, to do the Pledge of Allegiance, but go ahead. Please, please, thank you. Uh, on behalf of the board, president, and members, uh, the interim superintendent, and the uh, entire faculty and staff here at JPS, I want to thank you for uh, leading us in, uh, in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and uh, look forward to you doing bigger and bright things as you're into your senior year and also expecting bigger and bright things as you're into college and going forth and to doing those things that you aspire to be. Your, are your parents here tonight with you? No, you're not? I represent anyone? Any, how about any fellow classmates? Yes, yeah, a campus academy, academy, academy coach is here. Okay, <laughs> good deal. We saw that. Okay. okay, okay. All right, so you got some support, right? Good stuff. <laughs> but thank you so much. And on behalf of the uh, JPS, we have a, a bag here of some expressions of a, how much we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Okay. Which position in baseball do you play? I take a picture. George Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We will now have our moment of inspiration. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Reverend Nettie Winters. Reverend Nettie Winters, a native Mississippian, was born and raised in Tunica. He served, serves as president of Mission Mississippi, a movement in the body of Christ to reconcile individuals across racial and denominational lines. Nettie, a former pastor, is, a very effective, is very effective in preaching, teaching, and counseling in ways that have a positive impact on daily living. He is a consultant, coach, conference speaker, and workshop leader. He serves on various boards and is active in the community. Nettie holds a BS degree from Alcorn State University and is now serving as ASU's National Alumni President. He holds a master's degree in public financial management and an honorary doctorate of humanities, along with further biblical studies from the Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson. 
Reverend Winters is married to his lovely wife of 40 plus years, Mrs. Tommy Winters, and together they have five grandchildren and a number of grand grandchildren. They have five children and a number of grandchildren and great, 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 great <laughs> grandchildren. <laughs> they reside in Clinton, Mississippi. It is my pleasure to present Reverend Nettie Winters. You had to put a lot of emphasis on that. Great, 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 great. <laughs> That's great. It's what an honor and privilege it is to uh, be with you this afternoon to share words of inspiration. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to, to uh, challenge you in a way that I believe will benefit us as a community. Uh, I have this thought in my mind about uh, Generation Next and how do we empower the Generation Next. And I believe that we don't get stuck in a lot of stuff of the past and we don't get paralyzed by the pain and the problems of the past, but we focus our energy on that group which is Generation Next, starting at the first grade through 12th grade. I think that's Generation Next, and I think that one thing that we could do is to go forth with teaching and empowering them to master their possibilities, to energize them, to maximize their potential, and that as a board and as a school staff and as we look forward to the future, that we ought to measure our productivity in a way that will empower the next generation. So I'm challenging you to engage now that will empower Generation Next. It's been a privilege and an honor to be here with you all, and thank you for inviting me to come and be a part of this time with you. Thank, thank you. you, Reverend Winters, if you will stay there for a second. Um, our colleague, Reverend Lynn, would like to present you with a little token of our appreciation for you being here. Come down front, guys. Reverend. All right. Reverend, come on this side, Reverend. <laughs> Somehow he thinks he has a good side. Yeah, that's my good side. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, on behalf of the Board of Directors and Trustees for the Jackson Public School, we are so honored that you came tonight uh, to be with us and to bring some encouraging words. Generation Next, I like that. And we thank you for taking out time, because you didn't have to do it. But we, we know how busy you are, so we thank you. And this is a small token on, on behalf of the school district uh, that we want to share with you and to let you know that we appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you. We're now down to the, uh, we are established, a quorum of our members are here. Uh, we'll now go to the adoption of the agenda. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the, uh, tonight's agenda. Those in favor? Thank you. The reading and approving of the minutes of the June 6, 2017 regular meeting. Motion for approval. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve the minutes of June 6, uh, 2017 regular meeting. We're now down to public participation. Oh, sorry. Those in favor? Thank you. Uh, I didn't vote. Uh, I vote uh, no on that. You vote no? Okay. All right. We're now down to public participation. Board members, you have several persons who have signed up to address you this evening. First, uh, Micah Briggs, and I'm going to apologize, I'm not sure if I understand the writing, but indefinite suspension of policy, I think, is one question. How to follow up on previous question is another. and. How will a board address the, I think the word is intervention needs, given the visible spiral of violence, which includes JPS students, I think is a third question. You've got it. Okay, sir, you have three minutes. Have to make the most of it. 
Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for your time, and I'll jump right in here. Um, Dr. Murray, thank you for a willingness to look at a discussion and to plan for needed intervention. So before the meeting, I was even able to scratch off one <coughs> from my checklist. So I appreciate that, and I'll follow up with you. Um, I was kind of confused. I'm going to be cleared up really, really fast. When I was looking at district maintenance expenditures, I combined support services for students and support services for instruction. That was 6.1% um, of the budget compared to the 14% that's for operations and maintenance, which would end up covering uh, campus enforcement and things of that nature. I don't know if we're going to get the results we want if the service provider gets less than the service support that follows that the initial people the people that are on the front lines uh, those counselors you can't have 800 students and 700 of them with needs for psychological help for emotional help and then only have 2.5 counselors and think that's going to do it they're going to have six to 12 kids in each meeting nobody's going to open up well, it's a joke we're just it's people that are there to say we were there we've got to be uh, intentional about how that works and those funds they're right there 30 million dollars versus 12 million dollars so that was a, you know, my little limited ability to read through that. And then the next one, just a specific request on why, why can't we see the funds and the breakdowns of funds like this 45% uh, percent of the educational. Uh, it's all for instruction, which is going to include teacher salaries. How can we see the breakdown of what that looks like with the uh, allocation for those teachers and the supports for those teachers? Because just that 45% looks like half the budget. <coughs> It's, it's confusing if it's not broken down for the rest of us. I think that would be awesome. And the last thing, if the facilities don't get a much bigger share than $500,000, I can look at $500,000 damage just at Wingfield. And I still have a minute left to talk about the other parts of Wingfield that are going to exceed those funds. I don't know how that number came up, but $500,000. It, it almost looks like we're going to feed an army with a tic tac. That's not going to put a dent in the pain at all. That might just be one of our bathrooms. Um, I just want you to think about your babies in the last 30 seconds, I'm guessing. And if you have a grandchild or a godchild, how you love them and you hold them and have these high aspirations and hopes, and they might go to Tuskegee or Ivy League schools and just everything that we all want. And think about our babies because it's the opposite. And that's why two of our students from this year are facing murder charges right now. We got to flip the other dynamic. Thank you. Next is Deborah Atkins, voting last agenda election of officers, et cetera. Good evening. Good evening. I want to address the board in reference to the last meeting where you uh, elected and change your officers. One of the questions that I wanted to ask uh, was, was it fair? Were the Robert rules of order followed completely? And when you go into the Just, uh, Jackson Public School web page, and it opens up and it tells you that July the 26th of 1916, which was last year, you held your election and placed your officers that you have now. So my question is, why, why was the uh, election, the voting of the new officers put in so early rather than waiting until after the mayor had come in and placed the new board members? Another question that I have <coughs> is why today that you had the meeting, the budget meeting information from 4.30 to 5.30, and number one, you didn't have enough copies. Number two, she said it was not on the website because it had to be assembled, given to you all first. And I don't know why that wasn't done earlier so that it could be placed on the website so that the public could look at it and be able to really address the board with better questions uh, to you. That was not enough time. That's selfish. You're really not uh, supporting us as a community, as the public. Please put the information out there early for the public so that we can <coughs> appropriately address you about issues and concerns that we have. Another issue that I uh, wanted to question is as far as board members being bodily present. Because I notice we come sometimes and you're not here. And we would prefer to see all of your faces. If you take on this job, then I believe you should be present at all times. 
not just on the phone, that you should be present. Ms. Sims, you represent Ward 4, and you're late quite, you're not here sometimes quite a bit, so you're representing my ward. So to represent my ward, I would like for you to be present at all times. Thank you. Next is, I'm gonna apologize again, I'm not sure if I'm gonna get the name right, maybe Iman Thompson, who wants to address the board concerns about the recent board officer vote. Good afternoon, board. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to start by saying that as a community, we're not here to fight with the board. Uh, as I mentioned a few times ago, uh, we want to work with the board. Again, we just want to make sure the board want to work with, work with us. And when we vow to be here, we have been here and we're going to continue to be here. We are concerned about our children. I have a vested interest to be concerned about uh, our schools, our district, because I got children still coming through here. So instead of getting upset, like most people do, and move outside the district, which I could if I wanted to, I wanted to stay here and make our district better. And I wanted to do my part to make it better. So I want to address the, uh, uh, my, my, I sent an email to everyone. I don't know if all of y'all got it. And Ricky, yours bounced back, so that's probably why you didn't get it. I just want to take a minute to read my email and uh, uh, let you all know how I really felt about this. And uh, Ms. Burks, I kind of put on here that I meant it for you. Um, but I personally didn't like the way that the final business of the board uh, went uh, at the end of our last meeting. I feel like the decision to, uh, to nominate new officers was uh, shoved down our throats. Uh, and I was very unhappy at that time. So I think what was done demonstrated a lack of respect for our incoming mayor, for our new and current board members, and definitely a lack of respect for our parent boards. Uh, we as a parent community were was planning to suggest officers. We've been doing our homework and found out that we could have some suggestions. So we were planning, we was talking, and, and what do y'all think, and who would y'all like? But we did not get the opportunity to do that <clears throat> because of the decision that was made. So because of that, <clears throat> uh, that's, that's what we've been talking about as parents. You know, we don't get an opportunity to say anything Maybe they haven't been saying anything in the past, but again, that's something that we were looking forward to doing. Um, uh, as an outgoing president, uh, I know you may have had the rights. Oh, that's my time right up? No, you have a minute. Oh, a minute. Okay, and she read all of that, but I don't think it was ethical. I think it was sneaky. It was, it was at the end of the meeting when everybody was gone. Uh, it, it, it was other business. It was important. It was, to me, it was important, but it wasn't just other me. Uh, business and I, I wish that you would have taken the advice of Jed you know I think that we did have representation if that was your concern Ricky could have carried on till the new board came on uh, we have a good board you know so I don't like it and I want you to know we don't like it and I know uh, that you all are in place now the new board members but there's no disrespect on Mr. Lynn but we don't like it and we want to try to do something to change it you know so I just want to let you all know how we feel as a community and what our plans are and goals are, and we just don't think it was right the way it was done. Thank you. Thank you. Last is Otho Kane, election of board officers. Good evening. Good evening. As it relates to the last school board meeting and the final order of business, one of the issues community has is the suspension of regular rules of operation to elect new leadership, an unprecedented move never before done by an outgoing school board president, a move that leaves community questioning, and rightfully so, why? Why now? An interesting fact to point out is that the new mayor will have three school board appointments to fill, possibly shifting not only the balance of power, but the entire dynamic with which board decisions are made. Community questions whether this move to suspend regular board rules to elect a new leadership was a move intended to counter that very possibility. Community questions due to another odd and unethical move by this board and its president to not include this item on the regular agenda. 
agenda. We won't ask if that was intentional, as it is painfully obvious that it was indeed the intent of some on this board and the outgoing president more specifically to omit that item in an attempt to keep any other board members from quashing it and striking it from the agenda prior to the meeting. Community believes and would like to ask you, Ms. Bird, and those board members that readily agreed with this unethical move if you had prior conversations about this process, because in our minds, it was clearly and purposefully planned out and intended to be subversive. Community would also like to point out that when things like this occur, it highlights a continued disconnect between this district and the community and the blatant disregard for the well-being of the students this district serves. Were our children at the heart of this ill-time vote? Community questions also the actual person voted to be president in as much as you were told by students from Wingfield recently that the president-elect had absolutely no connections with Wingfield or any school in the ward that he allegedly represents. In fact, until recently, they didn't even know who he was. They, like several other students district-wide, thought Jed Oppenheim was their school board rep. But we thank you, sir, for the recent town hall meeting last week to introduce yourself. Community feels that this decision was made out of haste and desperation and rooted in some skewed and misguided ego-driven attempt to hang on to a seemingly powerful seat when in reality the president has no more power than any other board member one vote. So the questions community have are why? Why was this done? Why was this person elected? Why did it appear, why did it appear that all but one board member knew this vote or election would happen? We don't anticipate an answer from you tonight, but we want you to know that we've presented these same questions to the State Ethics Commission. We also submit that it would behoove this board to gain a basic understanding of the Roberts Rules of Order to avoid future public meltdowns. And while we don't require an answer tonight, we won't stop until the vote is rescinded and done above board, no matter who is elected. Anybody else? That's all. Thank you. Our next order of business. Did you sign up? OK. Oh, I'm sorry. Akimi Stout. Is that, OK. Sorry. sorry about that. Please. Oh, I know I got a weird name. Good evening, everyone. Evening. I am Akimi Stout with Jackson Federation of Teachers. The questions that I have are twofold. I have questions pertaining to the Code of Conduct book, and I reviewed it. I was a part of one of the committees where we said and we discussed some different things, different parameters that will work best for the educator as well as the student in the classroom. And one of those things is knowing that we have a high percentage of first year teachers that are in the classroom. We also have a high percentage of first year teachers that are leaving the classroom. And that's a dynamic that we need to figure out how to fix. One main thing as a union leader, and I represent educators, I represent paraprofessionals, those that are, you know, different related fields that are in education. One thing that I see that is not stressed enough, and I know this from having been in the classroom, is the restraint <coughs> policy. Young educators that are coming into the classroom need to understand not just the word corporal punishment, be under, but also understand all the dynamics that fall under corporal punishment, such as the restraint policy. We all know what took place several years ago and the restraint policy came into being. Those different things that have, that have happened in the last two years that I know specifically where teachers have, have been put out of the classroom that have lost their licenses as a result of this restraint policy need to be stated. That first week of school needs, it needs to be stated. It needs, they need to make sure the same way you do harassing, the same way you do sexual harassment, you need to talk about that, that restraint policy. Because I have kids in this school district. I am an invested parent. And I know from being in the classroom, and I know from being a parent, I also know from being a community partner. In the booklet, the teachers need to receive that booklet. And this is something I would like to know. If the teachers are going to actually receive this code of conduct book in the first month of school, not October, not January, not February. In order for you to be an effective instructor, you must have that tool because that's what you're going to be used. That's what's going to be used against you as an administrator. They're going to use that when it comes to the discipline policy, when it comes to how you're managing your students. So that needs to be done. 
One of the other things is in training, I want to make sure the teachers, the new teachers that are coming in and your veteran teachers, are they going to be trained how to use that book as a tool and not just something that sits in the classroom and that's not used? Administrators need to be trained, especially those that are transferring into the school district. They need to know how to use that book as a tool. Uh, let me see, I have one other thing here. Oh, the other policy, JDHAB, the restraint policy, I think I spoke about that, to make sure they know exactly what it means. That's on page 88 of the Code of Conduct book. The other question I had, which is the last one, and I think I'm down to a few sections, was page 14, dealing with the budget and the buses. One of the things that was brought up was about a siren or something on the bus. Is that something new that's going to be added to the buses, especially those 44 buses that was just discussed, that was just discussed in the budget committee? Is that something that's additional, that's going to be an additional cost, or would this be something that will already come on these buses. I'm gonna double check one more time. <laughs> That's all I have. All right. Thank you. We're now down to the superintendent's report. Dr. Murray. Greetings, uh, board members, JPS administrators and staff, community members uh, in attendance this evening. Uh, community focused student artwork. An extensive array of artwork uh, created by our student artists from several schools in the Lanier feeder pattern is on display uh, as a part of the 2017 Ask for More Art Student Art Exhibit. Uh, Jackson State University students and local artists engage students in a variety of art experiences to teach them about uh, different uh, forms of art. The exhibit is open to the public until July 30th at Johnson Hall on the campus of Jackson State University, located at 1400 Lynch Street. Gallery hours are from 9 to 5, uh, Monday through Friday, and we encourage you uh, to visit this awesome uh, exhibit. I had an opportunity to go last week, and it was extremely rewarding. Bus driver job fair. Uh, Jackson Public Schools is hosting a job fair for prospective bus drivers on June 24th, July 15th, and July 22nd. These events will be held from 9 to 12 in the school board meeting room located at 621 South State Street. Uh, great drivers are in high demand. Uh, no experience is necessary. Uh, successful candidates can look forward to competitive hourly rates, excellent benefits, and holidays off. Uh, for more information, visit JPS website or call 960-8919. The JPS Summer Feeding Program uh, JPS Food Service Department will continue the summer feeding program until July 14th. Uh, meals are served from 11 to 12:30 on Monday through Friday. The summer feeding program will close will be closed on July 3rd and 4th. For a complete list of summer reading sites, visit JPS website. For more information, contact the JPS Food Service Department at 601-960-8911. Update on APAC program. During the school year of 2017-2018, the Jackson Public School District will offer academic uh, performing arts complex program at Forest Hill High School. Replicating the successful practices of Murrah High School, qualifying students currently enrolled at Forest Hill High will have the opportunity to select academic, APAC academic courses during uh, on-site registration this summer. The primary goal of this program uh, expansion is to offer more rigorous academic programs throughout our district to ensure equitable access to learning opportunities for students. Teachers will begin their pre-advanced placement and advanced placement training this summer uh, in July at Millsaps College and the University of Mississippi. Research consistently shows that students who take rigorous courses earn higher grade point averages, have higher graduation rates, and have higher college completion rates. Interested parents and students will complete a program interest form, and the school's leadership team will review interested students' end of year course average, star reading assessments, uh, English and math, or reading and math, and state assessment results, uh, if applicable, to determine students' eligibility. Additional information is forthcoming and will be posted on our district website. And we want to make clear that no students that are currently at Murrah will be required to transfer. Again, we're opening up the option to those students that choose to stay at their home school. Uh, the option will be available to have APAC at their home school in South Jackson uh, at Forest Hill. Um, uh, just uh, uh, additional updates on the CAP. We are, uh, we've 
uh, coming we're coming to a, a end uh, with our uh, investigative audit. We there were some buildings uh, that were reviewed last week and uh, some buses, and I think that was kind of the, the they're entering the final phase of that. Uh, we look forward to uh, receiving a report hopefully in the next 30 to 60 days. Uh, again, so again we we've been working very closely, uh, communicating with um, with MDE. Uh, as it relates to uh, them following up with those things that they needed to come back and see. So we're hoping, again, we've not gotten any final information on the completion, uh, but we, we do have some preliminary uh, information that uh, seems to show that they're coming to the end of this process. So hopefully uh, we'll be getting a report uh, in short order. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Lockett to come forward uh, to talk about uh, a recent facilities assessment that's been conducted. Good evening, Ms. Burge, President, members of the board, Dr. Mary. Tonight I'm excited that we had the opportunity to provide one more layer to what the MDE's CAP report gave to us. We decided, along with the leadership of Dr. Mary, to go out and do our own internal needs assessment. I'm excited tonight to introduce to some and present to many Mr. William McElroy the owner, operator, architect of M3A Architecture and his company, members and colleagues that will come forward tonight and give you the findings of our own internal need assessment. I do give a disclaimer to this, is that we didn't look at the cosmetics of a building, we actually looked at the intrinsic safety problems, those things that could cause harm to students, faculty, and staff in a building. We looked at aging infrastructures, as uh, Ms. Miller said earlier, and we also identified that we have a large majority of aging infrastructures, but that still does not put on the back burner safety. We've had to actually close down some classrooms this year because of some aging infrastructure problems to remove students out of those classrooms. Safety, safety, safety is going to be our number one priority, not the excuse of aging infrastructures. So at this time, I'll ask Mr. McElroy and his team to come forward and give you a presentation, brief presentation on some of the findings. Uh, one of the discussions tonight will be Wingfield High School that we had in a recent town hall meeting. Uh, I will tell you this, that the M3A Architecture Association has not only visited it on the initial needs assessment, but we've actually gone back out while the students are out of school to look at a closer view of each building. So that's an additive that they gave to us because they are members of the community. So at this time, Mr. McElroy, your team, please, sir. Thanks. Thank you. It is again a pleasure to be with you. On this occasion, I have been before this board and previous boards on numerous occasions before when we were looking at how to package the district needs in a practical manner to uh, deliver world-class uh, uh, training for our students. Uh, first of all, to the superintendent, uh, thank you for involving us and the president of the board, board members and the support staff, we thank you that we're, we're given charge to kind of help you determine the physical needs of these 22 buildings. And a physical needs assessment is just what it sounds like. We go into the buildings and we determine the physical needs by looking at a number of criteria to, to determine if they perform and conform to various safety regulations and to standards uh, uh, as it relates to code and life safety performance and determine if there's infiltration at the roof and uh, and the building envelope, and if there are accessibility issues which are paramount because they bring liability back to the issue. We also observe if there are electrical or lighting deficiencies which might hinder or diminish the performance of the students utilizing those spaces. So it is not an exhaustive uh, uh, and detailed analysis of what is there. We do not do any building forensics. We do not x-ray the columns to determine if the re-steel in those structures are adequate. We do not measure the water content in the roof substrate to see if it has, uh, if it is, 
saturated beyond usage. But based on a visual observation and surveillance, we can pretty much assess and determine which systems need to be looked at, and we can rank those systems and prioritize them in a zero, one, two, three, and four uh, kind of a rating. A four rating would be in excellent condition. A three rating would be in a very good condition. A two rating would be adequate. A one uh, would denote that that building component needs addressing within the next three years or so. And, and a zero rating essentially means that immediate attention should be given to, the, to those building components. So in order to talk about the items that we discovered in all 22 schools would be, again, an, ex an exhaustive er exercise. So we took two facilities that we use as a model of what we observe. And I'm going to have one of our chief architects, Oludis Nkusa, to walk through uh, the deficiencies as we discovered and cited at uh, Brinkley and Wingfield High School. So, Mr. Lucasen. While we're transitioning, do, do we have copies of this, of, of the full 22 that we could yes, do? Yes, for you. They have all been delivered to the district, and as well as digital copies, uh, and we'll explain why we think the digital copies are going to be of immense value to you going forward. Uh, good evening, board members, and good, good evening, evening um, audience. Um, my name is Kusa Olutosi with M3 Architecture, and just like uh, Mr. Makara said, we, we spend time looking at these 22 schools um, in pretty good detail to kind of like look at the most um, important um, issues that as, a, as, as regards to the minimum requirements for occupation of the buildings. Uh, for We really looked at Wingfield High School and Brinkley High School in detail for tonight, just to kind of show you what some of the representative issues were. And um, most of the things we looked at really were like um, code compliance issues. Thank you. Um, like we looked at co code compliance issues, uh, accessibility compliance issues, envelope integrity, and mechanical electrical and plumbing systems. So essentially, like we're looking to see if there are any serious violations in the building in terms of um, uh, compliance to code, you know, as, as, as required for today. Accessibility compliance in terms of like um, access for people that have disabilities and uh, envelope integrity involves the roof, the, the, you know, the walls, the windows, stuff like that. And general HVAC systems, electrical and plumbing systems. All right, so looking at Wingfield, we, we discovered that the MDE already had an audit on this building, which kind of involved like um, standing water in the tunnel area under the school. So there's kind of like significant uh, water drainage issues where we have um, water backing out from the um, storm sewers around the building on site, and and that's kind of causing a significant issue in the in the building. Uh, but one of the main issues we found here was uh, severe accessibility issues on site. Uh, next slide, please. And if you get to the site on Wingfield High School, essentially, like there's poorly marked uh, parking stalls. Essentially, like you, you see the um, ADA parking area in that area, but there's no well-defined markings. Uh, you look on the right side here, we have the ADA parking there, but there's no, no accessible route to get a wheelchair from a vehicle into the building. And these are very critical um, accessibility issues because you actually get um, lawsuits and claims from, you know, not because the ADA rules are a legislation issue, it's not a code issue. Uh, and it's pretty important to comply with this. Some of this, these changes are, are minimal and they can be done, you know, pretty easily just to give us like a minimum uh, standard of, um, uh, of, of compliance with codes and, and laws uh, for the state. Next slide. Uh, one of the issues we found, like several areas uh, across all the schools we saw, broken pavement and trip hazard and sidewalks, uh, sinkholes near a lot of cash basins, which is kind of like tied to the issue I raised before about this uh, drainage issue across the site um, in most cases. Uh, next slide. Uh, talking also about accessibility issues, we're looking at the restroom areas. Uh, most of these restrooms were um, upgraded about 10, 12 years ago, I believe, but a lot of them have issues with um, um, accessibility compliance. Like you can see, look at this um, urinals in this area. 
not one of them is low enough to be used by someone in a wheelchair. Uh, you look at the, um, the restroom in this area, it's not big enough to allow like a wheelchair turn in that space. So those are critical issues that, you know, at a minimum, at least you have to have accessible restrooms, you have to have accessible part of access to a building. And uh, in many cases, we don't have that at Wingfield. Uh, next slide. Uh, going around the same issue, we have, um, you know, some of the ADA, um, you know, some of the lavatories are not of the right height. Um, you, you notice the piping around there is not covered to prevent people in wheelchairs from bumping into them. Uh, same issue here with rest, in, in the restroom area. Just kind of like on a general note, Wingfield is like on, you know, like, you know, in, in very, very bad shape. And all we're trying to do now is not even just look at the aesthetic, we're trying to get you information that will get you to a point where this building is actually occupiable, you know, by law. You know, and we're looking at the big, big picture issues. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have some issues like, you know, in the, you look at some of the threshold areas, we have like a trip hazard right there between the, the entrance into the restroom where, you know, you, you have a, a, a distance of more than an inch, you know, you definitely can put a wheelchair in there, a wheelchair in that area. Uh, some of the areas like near the stage, we have uh, a makeshift uh, step system that was, I guess, added onto the stage, but then you don't have any handrails or guardrails to prevent people from falling through. Um, you know, on some of the stairs, you have uh, missing um, treads and risers, uh, cover pieces over there. That kind of leads to like a trip hazard. Uh, on the guardrail area, some of the guardrails are less than 42 inches high, and uh, they have holes in them that can, you know, let, uh, normally by code for today, you need to have guardrails that are 42 inches high and have, um, be of such a construction where you cannot pass a four inch, you know, spray through it. We don't have that. So these are kind of like big issues that are everywhere. Just because the building was you know, built like 30, 40 years ago. So a lot of these things, I guess, have been grandfathered in. But we're getting to a point where you know, your liability is not grandfathered in. If, some, if someone happens to be injured as a result of some of this violation, you still end up with a liability regardless. Um, next slide. So um, apart from all the accessibility issues, there's certain issues uh, regarding Wingfield where we think there's some foundation movement. Uh, you, you can tell from looking at some of the walls, you can see cracks in the walls and stuff like that. And we believe uh, there's significant movement in some areas, but this will require more uh, structural forensic to determine where exactly these issues are and to determine the best course of action to either stop them or solve the issues entirely. Uh, next slide. Um, some, of the, some of the areas we have like just a general renovation issue where some of the carpeting areas are, you know, piling up that tread bare carpet. And some of this might be simple maintenance issues where you probably could replace, you know, some of them in, in some kind of palliative measure. But still, at the end of the day, you're going to have to, um, over the next couple of years, come up with some way to, you know, upgrade this, 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 uh, these facilities in a way that takes care of some of the deferred maintenance that, that seems to be happening here. Uh, we have some some you know, leaks from the roof area on some of the ceilings and all that. And um, looking at the roof, uh, next slide please. We, we have, uh, this roof is about 20, 25 years old and it's a modified bitumen roof and it's already reaching the end of its service life. Uh, you have delaminated modified bitumen in many areas. You have some of the granules that cover this roof you know, already peeling off. And at a minimum, at least you have to go back and do some kind of repair, which is, you know, go back and put a coating on the roof, which will probably give you like a 10, 15 year warranty um, if, we don't, if, we, if we don't want to replace it now. And we really would suggest that this be one of the first priority items because you don't want to go fixing the interior stuff before you actually fix the roof itself so you don't end up, you know, throwing good money after that. Um, next slide. All right, so uh, just, just in general, um, we're talking about restriping the parking lot, uh, repairing damaged sidewalks, resolving the site accessibility issues, upgrading to ADA compliant restrooms, uh, resurface the aging uh, roof, um, a few you know, miscellaneous renovations on the inside, and then there's several uh, mechanical units um, that were identified in reports that need to be replaced. You know, they're kind of reaching the end of their service life and stuff that you, I guess we need to look into replacing them. Uh, and of course, there's no um, uh, air conditioning in the gym. So, um, you know, that's not really a life safety issue, but it's a convenience issue that we really should look into. Uh, and of course, there's also security issue in terms of like site lighting. Uh, there's no adequate site lighting across the, the campus. Uh, now we'll look at um, Brinkley Middle School. Can, can um, I wait, ask a wait, question wait. before we <laughs> All those items cited on that particular school, are, some of them 
present liability uh, conditions now <coughs> where the school can be assessed uh, for not uh, mitigating these conditions that are considered basic uh, deliveries for uh, your students and they represent money we in the back of this document we can we have tabulated what some of those costs might be to rent uh, to remediate these conditions in the short order now again we did not conduct forensic sciences right. to determine some of the things that are deficient or that need attention to determine the scope and the level of work to uh, to bring those systems up to par. Did you? Uh, but, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. But a number of those uh, items, uh, a bulk of them, deserve attention within that first five-year frame. That's what I was about to ask. If you prioritize them in a way uh, that tells us that we what we need to do immediately, like he was talking about the roof, the roof that could perhaps have a coating that might, might extend, that might the extend life. the life, but right. that you prioritize them in a way to say from urgency to can wait, uh, can be delayed. Yes, and, and, and again, we wanted to uh, kind of, and, and the first one, that's, that's uh, all of the reports are the same. Pretty much, uh, they cover the same uh, kinds yeah, of things. Buildings exactly. Buildings. But what what we wanted to show, we had some extensive questions the other night about uh, the facilities and the phases of this work. So we wanted to demonstrate uh, again, in order to know what you have to do, then you have to have this type of assessment uh, done. And so that that's the point uh, of this presentation uh, to demonstrate to the community that we've we are. Uh, moving forward, we're trying to have all of our buildings assessed so that we can know we can prioritize and be able to make some informed decisions as it relates to the budget. Okay. If we would like the public to know and the board that we'll be very transparent in this effort. There's no rocks going unturned in this, as you can see from the demonstration at Wingfield. We're going to offer this to the board uh, at each visit that we may have town hall visits or just your general day to day processing of a building you slap this into your laptop pull up that particular school and it tells you everything within that needs assessment for the first 22 and then we'll do it for the remainder but a very transparent operation we have binders of every school that's being audited inspected uh, of course m3a company stands ready for any discussions you may have further but we are going into schools and we're looking at safety as a priority. And we're not going to leave any rocks unturned toward that. And we'll come back with a cost analysis toward those efforts. Also. This, is, this is really, really um, incredibly needed. And, um, you know, whenever anything is brought to the light, um, it, it's, it's been brought to the fore. So there's got to be a way to figure out how we're going to address them because now we know what they are. So, uh, Dr. Murray, uh, we really do have to really think about uh, quickly, it seems, how to mitigate some of these uh, potentially hazardous problems for us as well. Yes, Mr. Oppenheim. Thank you, um, and I appreciate this disc. It would have been more helpful to have it before our budget hearing because I think a lot of questions were raised about it. But the, um, on the page, could you go back to one sheet to the um, recommendations? For Wingfield, yeah, thank you. So on the on the top assessment, it's talking about the water drainage and the odor problems. And clearly, I, d I don't know um, like facilities management stuff. But I, where is that linked up to the recommendations, or is that just the the resurfacing of the the roof would address the issues around? Because it's interesting to see that statement about the water standing and the odor, which has been an issue as long as I've lived in Jackson but not to necessarily see a direct recommendation in the recommendations piece, at least not in my untrained eyes. That, from uh, my understanding in visiting with Mr. McElroy, all of it is connected to drainage. As you saw this sinkholes earlier that was shown on the video, all of it's connected to drainage, and that's where we're going to start from, is uh, going in and looking at drainage situation at Wingfield High School. And, uh, you know, you can cover it, one of the recommendations was one time to go in and cement it in, but you're covering drainage problems, which will go back and resurface again. So we're not going to cover it. We're going to go in and find the 
significant source and then fix it. So which recommendation is that? Drainage. Under, under drainage. Under your drainage. Repair drainage. You got sidewalks. Repair, repair damaged sidewalks, parking lots, your accessibility. We'll add that, excuse me. Thank we'll add that. It is a drainage point that we'll add. Any other questions to the company or myself? Yeah. Dr. Lamb. Yeah, I, and I appreciate for this information, but how do we how do we allow the community to see the, and see this as well? Is yes, there, sir. They're there made available at Enox in the facilities department out of my office. So if the community want to get a copy of this, they, they can get uh, And a presentation, one-on-one -on -one up in the library. We'll set up visits, just like the town hall meetings, right. to address individual schools if we need to. Okay. Is it, is it uh, problematic to kind of put something like that on the website so to let the community know where they can get that information from? I'll be visiting with everybody on that matter, okay. sir, Thank you. legally and okay. yeah, we'll Yes, Mr. Jones. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of the roof, was the roof assessed during the uh, uh, hailstorm back, uh, I guess, in 14? It was assessed? Afterwards. Afterwards? Okay, so so some of that perhaps may... Let me get you to step to the mic. So within the past 30 days, the there has been... Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, you stepped to the mic. Within the past 30 days, there was a roofing specialist that surveyed the roof and rendered an opinion based on the uh, projected life of the roof and, and gave us a scenario that, that if the roof were repaired, what the uh, projected extended life could potentially be. Okay, so he noted that, it, that there, were, there was damage due to hail? There was some pitting, that is correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Miller, was that one of the roofs that w were covered? No. Okay. It might be useful to try to figure that out mm -hmm. so that there might be some ways that we might be able to capture some dollars. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Oppenheim. Thanks, Madam President. And, and I, did, I wanted to echo Reverend Lynn's point about making it open for the community. One of the reasons why we asked that, too, because th this is hard work and we appreciate you doing it. One of the things that we could get from the community as well, because this is our community, is support on some of these things too. So it's not just to say, here's all these 50,000 issues that are going on, but maybe there's somebody in the community who has the skill set that we haven't thought about to kind of get at some of these problems. So to Reverend Lynn's point, that's as much why we want to be transparent about having this stuff public. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Um, Ms. Burton and uh, Dr. Lockett, I do appreciate this uh, assessment because we do need to prioritize how we spend our money and which buildings are going to need our em most immediate attention. Uh, I would like um, perhaps you and Ms. Miller to get together because I understand that we should be doing some roofing this summer um, as a result of the hail storm that we're doing, if you can bring us up to date along with the assessments that we're doing with this so we'll know um, what things are going to be done over the summer months and where we can prioritize the, the two um, with the 22 schools that we're going to do. Our new executive director uh, starting July the 1st, Mr. McCracken, is in the audience and we're going to put him into the fire. Starting off, he will be coming back to you with that assessment at the uh, next board meeting. All right, I hope he's got his shoes on because we're going to be working with him. All right. I, I, I do have one other question, if I may, Go ahead. as it relates to the assessment of the roof. As you all eyeballed it, a visual, um, with the roof damage that's uh, been apparent, made apparent, did that include interior? interior did you see anything in, inside the uh, facility that may have? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Like you know, just like in any roofing issue, you have interior finishes that are damaged. Uh, mostly just the ceilings and okay. some of the walls are wet, stuff like that. Okay. But you know, like like just like we said, you know, we have to fix up all the roof issues before we do all the interior finishes. Okay. Yeah. But with that, you, you noted a piece of, I guess, a floor tile or something that was yes, in there. Absolutely. With the leak from that roof uh, going through the ceiling, 
have caused that as well? Uh, not necessarily. What it could have, it could have added to it. Like most of the tiles in the building are original to the building, and a lot of them are, I guess, like you know, getting loose from age and just from use. And um, so I think you know, it might it might have added to it, but it was not the original cause for it. No. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, lastly. Uh, just want to just take a, a point of privilege um, to first uh, thank Ms. Mumford. This is Ms. Mumford's uh, last uh, meeting. Uh, we want to thank her for her service. We had a, a breakfast this morning and provided her with a nice plaque. Uh, but we appreciate you, Ms. Mumford. I think nine years of service, uh, and she has truly been committed. So we thank you, Ms. Mumford, uh, for your service. Okay, we could, uh, let me, and, uh, okay. and we have a board has a presentation for you. Uh, Ms. Mo oh, did you want to do that now or? Let's do it then. Okay. Yeah. So you want to come down front? <laughs> Ms. Mumford, on behalf of the school board, thank you so much for your many years of service. Uh, I've, this is my fifth year. You were here when I came, and I understand you were here prior to that. So thank you so much uh, for the hard work. It is difficult working for this group, <laughs> so, but um, you, are, you are here, and you've always been professional in terms of the work that you've done, and you've always had a smile. Uh, in spite of us. So thank you very much. We so appreciate this for your years of service to the Jackson Public School District as well. We wish you many, many happy returns in your future endeavors. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bird, and thanks to you, everyone, community people, board members. It's been my pleasure. It's just like hand in glove for me, and I'm going to miss this place, and I love this place. Thank you so much. And we'd also like to uh, just introduce Ms. Rosalind Williams, if you could wave. Ms. Rosalind Williams is our new uh, board secretary. She'll be uh, doing double duty, working out of the superintendent's office as well as uh, serving as board secretary. So welcome, uh, Ms. Williams. Welcome, Ms. Williams. Just one more uh, recognition, Ms. Burt. Uh, yes. This is uh, Ms. Burt's. I think last meeting. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, 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 26. Uh, when? 26. We have to approve the budget. Budget. Oh, You could come down. This is presented to Ms. Benita D. Burt in appreciation for your exemplary service to the Board of Trustees, July 18, 2012 to June 30th, Good evening. On behalf of your colleagues, board members, we know that this has been uh, a major job this year. Um, 
It's taken a lot of patience. It's taken integrity. And we appreciate your heart, service, and involvement, not only with the, the board members, the faculty, the staff, the superintendent, and the community. On behalf of all of us, we want to just give you a small token of appreciation and say, we appreciate you and we wish you well on your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sims. I'd just like to say that um, it's been uh, a joy for me to be on this board for the past five years. And um, every day has not been a, a, a good day, but you know, everybody must serve. Shirley Chisholm says that service is the debt you pay for being here, for the space that you occupy. And so I think that you have to serve. And things will never, ever be the very optimum for every day that you have. But service is important. I have given my very best to this community in terms of public service as long as I've been an adult. I don't intend to stop doing that. And I would encourage everyone to know that your responsibility is to serve. You got to serve somebody that uh, where you, know, you don't expect anything back that it is because you want to be able to do it. And I think that we all need to serve, and we all need to be productive in the way that we serve. So I thank you very much for the time, the colleagues that I've met here, uh, and the students, and I will continue working with your students. You know I was before, and I will continue doing that in the work that we do. So thank you very much, and it has been uh, an esteemed pleasure for me to serve uh, as your board representative. Okay. Right. This is the superintendent's report. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Murray. We are now down to update on. Um, Middle schools location changes for school administrators for school year 217 18. Mrs. Evans, is she here? Are we finished that? Wait a minute, we finished that. I guess I said this is not what this says. Okay, somebody give me a good agenda. So, are we at because this one it says okay. All right, uh, Dr. Sargent. Good evening. Good evening. Tonight we have an update of our at-risk reports. Uh, this will be the final report for the 16-17 school year. And tonight you will hear from the middle school and high school division. Uh, so at this time, we'll ask them to come up and do their presentation. We're here from the high schools tonight. Is that oh, okay. Something? Good evening, Ms. Burke, members Good evening. of the board, and Dr. Murray. The report from Lanier High School, under leadership, they continue to engage in checks to ensure effective implementation of school practices outlined uh, for school administration. Curriculum and instruction, they indicated the goal is increase the number of students who are successful in subject area courses on assessment increase the graduation rate at Lanier High School. Uh, they engaged in instruction during the last few weeks were based on mastery of standards. Teachers in about individualized instructions based on the needs of the students. Uh, the senior students that failed the end of course exam were informed of the program, which is the Heinz Option, which was a program for a mini session uh, if they met the requirements to enroll in that program in lieu of the state test. Uh, and lastly, stakeholders were involved in planning and preparation of grade level academic achievement ceremonies, and stakeholders had an opportunity to speak with students and give out scholarships during the school day, and that was under the school climate and safety. Any questions relative to the report for Lanier? Mr. 
Oppenheim is then Mr. Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sam, for bringing that. Could you explain um, the Heinz Community College option in a little bit more detail that the students are partaking in if they failed that exam? Yes, sir. As you know, the uh, one of the options for students as it relates to the test, if you're not successful on the uh, end of course test or the state test, if you have a certain school in the ACT, then you can enroll in a dual enrollment course. Uh, for example, if you were not successful on the English test, then you can enroll at Heinz or some other school, but in this case Heinz, and take composition, and it would count as the uh, course for dual enrollment. And as long as the student is successful in that particular course, then they, although they didn't pass the test, they met one of the options available to them. So Heinz offered this program through a mini session at the end, near the end of the school, uh, and we had students to sign up for it. Uh, transportation was provided by Heinz from Jackson to the campus in Utica. Uh, and it was a two-week class where students had to go daily. If they were successful on that for the uh, test that they were not successful on, then they met the requirement for uh, high school graduation. And is that option open to all of the high schools? Yes, sir. Uh, Lanier just had, only because we're doing a report on them, but okay. all of the high schools uh, had students, or we made that information available to the students and to the parents of those students who had not been successful on the uh, exam. Uh, we had some students who enrolled in the course and others who opted not to for various reasons. But all the high schools did make the information available to the parents and the students. And just last follow up on that. Um, I know this, the state testing company, there was some news story about the state testing company um, and some of those test scores. Did that affect <coughs> any of our students? And if so, do we have a sense of how many? Uh, we, we do not have that information at this time. I'm sure the state is going to make us aware of it as it becomes available to them. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh. Mr. Question. Jones. Thank you. Um, from the, the third, third semester, or third term uh, exams, what, what was gleaned from those uh, results and how were the results used to um, move the students forward? Once the uh, exam data was provided to the schools, then the leadership team at the school, along with the teachers, they met and analyzed the data. Then they got back with the teachers to provide the information to them concerning student performance. In terms of how many students scored at a certain level, what the area of deficiencies might have been, and then from there individualize the lessons so that you can hopefully impact how the students perform. Okay, so what were those numbers? What, what did they look like? I do not have those numbers with me, sir. Okay, um, let's talk about how the data that was produced uh, at Lanier in your FIT meetings, how did, that, how did those meetings go? Once the information, the test data is sent down to the school, then the school leadership team during their FIT meetings, they would take that particular data and around the table have discussions about those things that students were not successful on in terms of mastery. You look at the percentage of students scoring at a particular level based on the standards that were being taught and tested. Then from there, you develop a plan based on what is left to be taught in the curriculum and go back and the teachers, they're actually in there and involved as well. So it's a committee of people that actually sit and look at the data that's being disaggregated to determine what needs to take place to address those particular deficiencies. Okay, you, you use the word you uh, uh, go in and, 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 and uh, in that term. So I guess, the, Dr. Murrow, I'm looking at the question uh, I'm asking, you know, with a little feedback on is, um, based on the information that was gleaned from the third terms uh, exams, mm -hmm. where were the students and how did the adjustment uh, was made in order to see uh, uh, what, as he stated, uh, adjustment was made to move those students forward, to, to pull them, I guess y'all would use, just making sure that they are, were on track to, uh, you know, where they needed to be and so on. Yeah. Well, with all of our data, not just the third term, but the you know star results, uh, common assessments, uh, that all of that data is consistently used to uh, 
to support students and, and, and guide the instructional practices. So that was done third term. When we received that data back, uh, again, he, he, t he outlined the FIT process, but uh, instruction was individualized. Some students, there were some uh, boot camps done in some cases. There were some individualized tutorial, some small group tutorials. Um, different teachers did different creative things within their, uh, within their uh, teams. So uh, there were a myriad of things that were done at Lanier to support those students and prepare them for, for state testing. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mr. Jones and Dr. Lynn. I'm sorry, um, Mr. Oppenheim. Yeah, just one, just one last real quick question. Do those, for the students who go down to Hines, is there any cost to them or is that free of charge? No, sir, it's a cost. Uh, it's $110 per hour, so approximately $330 per three hour course. Uh, and then there's a fee associated with it. So it rounds off to about $350 per three hour course. Are we able to find a partner who could help pay for those, for those students? Can we work at, on that? At this time, we did not, but moving forward, uh, we're looking into some options that may very well be available based on what some other districts are doing. Right, because that might be something that we could have some partners step in, given that that makes it horribly unreasonable for probably 90% of those kids. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Dr. That. Lamb. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what what new processes do we have in place so that our senior or so we can ensure that our seniors have a better chance of passing those end of course exams? I think that it's safe to say that the the systems that we have in place are effective. We have to ensure that we effectively monitor those to ensure optimal success for students. So what we need to do is continue on the path that we're on, is identifying those students early, uh, isolating those skills that they were not successful on in terms of the test, and then providing them with the necessary supports that they need to be successful on the test. So what process do we have in place then to ensure that what we have works? When you because you, you're saying that we've got a good system, but obviously the system failed. Well, I don't know if the system. Well, okay. Well, I think I think what what it goes back to, um, Dr. Lynn, is you have to monitor, you have to inspect what you expect. I mean, right. we say that, but but you actually have to monitor the system uh, because it the vast well. We're not, I don't think that it's, uh, it's failure. There are some students that are not being successful yeah. for, for many reasons. Uh, and some of that goes all the way back to uh, early literacy skills that they lack and they have problems with the reading components in English. You know, So there, there are a lot of different reasons. But as uh, Dr. Stan noted, we isolate, we find out what's going on through our early assessments, through our um, we progress monitor. We progress monitor. We give students uh, the screener at the very beginning so we can identify those areas where they're weak, where they're deficient. And then we work through that. We put systems in place, uh, individualized programs for those students to help them, interventions uh, at different levels. And then we have to monitor that. We have to monitor that. When we monitor it, then we see the progress. When they test again, for example, STAR, a benchmark test, we see the results. We see them making progress. But if you don't monitor it, uh, and again, that's where you'll see gaps. But if we monitor that, and that's, that's, those are systems, and that's a part of the work that we're talking about with every administrator we'll be training on this summer. You have to put systems in place to monitor uh, the work that we're expecting in buildings. And so we'll be doing that to close those gaps, to keep those numbers of students uh, from being unsuccessful. So, so are you saying that the, the, the new system will be to put in something to monitor the, pro the progress and to make sure that we don't well, have those gaps? Well, again, it's, Which, it's always been the system to monitor, but, again, but you, have to, you actually have to do the monitoring. Is what I'm saying. So students, if 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 you are not if if a student is on a plan, and you are not monitoring that plan, and you're not providing the adjustments that are uh, that are outlined um, in in the plan, then right. you're not making any adjustments, and the student is not going to be successful. Right. If you're not putting the interventions in place, so what again? What we're doing is that's the leadership that is responsible in the building for making sure that those systems are in place 
to guide that work. And so what we're doing is making sure that that happens. Yeah, I, I mean, I got that. Mm -hmm. But we still had some, some seniors fail. And if I hear you right, I've got that part down. Yes, sir. It comes down to having someone to follow up and to follow through. So the question is, <clears throat> I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it, mm -hmm. what do we have in place to ensure mm -hmm. that that's happening? <coughs> because all I'm hearing now is we have to monitor. Well, what do we have in place well, we to have ensure a, that that's going yes, to take we place? Have, well, we have a, a focus instructional team process for monitoring. We have a system in place uh, that's not just talk. We have a system that we utilize on a weekly basis to look at the data, to make the determinants, to provide the, uh, the support uh, to the teams, to report out to, to you all through uh, different mechanisms when we provide um, the information that you've requested as it relates to scoreboards and things like that. So those are, the system is the process. It is what we have in place, the FIT process, the focus instructional team process <coughs> of, of monitoring the data is what's in place. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Yeah, thank you. How many students over there at Lanier, juniors starting there as well as seniors, took the ACT? The entire junior class uh, had to take the ACT okay. and, because it's a part of the accountability model. Okay. So all of the rising seniors <coughs> should have a score of ACT on file going into the senior year. Okay. How many of those seniors retook it or, you know, to, because you mentioned um, going to Heinz to, 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 you know, to take uh, classes and so on. So the question is, how many of those seniors that took the ACT, um, uh, how many basically took the ACT? Oh. How many seniors or juniors? Sir? No, seniors. He said he stated that um, all students that are juniors, uh, rising seniors, had you mm -hmm. know have to take the uh, ACT. We understand that's the MDE mandate. Yes, but the right. question is, in terms of the number of seniors that actually took the ACT, that met <coughs> or whatever that score is, and, and kind of let us know that mm -hmm. specifically for Lanier. Lanier. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. We'd have to capture that data because it doesn't. It doesn't. For example, it doesn't come back to us like it does. Like it does for juniors. Those students who are who go out to a Millsaps or a Bellhaven or uh, somewhere to take an assessment, they don't send a report back to Lanier every time those students test. The data is available, but we would have to go out there and capture that data. Uh, again, and I just recently found that out. I thought that it was a system where all of the data was automatically sent back to the to the high school, but other than your junior year, it doesn't work that way. You have to go out there and capture that data and bring it back. So we'll be looking at ways to do that because it's our responsibility to plug those scores in. For example, if you make a 16 as a junior and then you take the uh, retake the assessment and you make a higher score, it's up to us uh, to to put that higher score in. So right. that, that's going to be important that we that we track that. Yeah, and that was going back to the question of exactly these number of students that perhaps um, had to take these classes at Heinz at $300 per, per class. Mm -hmm. So in essence, th there is no definitive answer on the number of those students that perhaps taken the ACT and perhaps e even met uh, those requirements is what Oh, oh, oh yes. Sir. Well, so, counselors, you know, that's a part of uh, of evaluating the student's transcript. They okay. look at all of those students. Again, they have to capture that information. If it's not, if you don't meet the requirement as a junior, then the counselors, when they're looking at a student that has not passed the state test, then they're looking at every single option. That's a part of uh, the monitoring piece that we did in January when we looked at every senior. It's the responsibility of that guidance counselor to go in and say, well, can, can we take the ACT score as a, uh, uh, as a substitute for them not making the score that they needed to make on the English assessment? So that's, that's done for every single senior. That's done, and at the end of their junior year, their transcripts are evaluated to determine what they need as they move into uh, their senior year. Okay, so on average, and I continue to go here, this is interesting information. Uh, um, as it relates to um, the students that are taking the, the ACT, <coughs> mm -hmm. and they have a chance of taking it free three times, right? To my understanding, the state pays for one a junior year, and they get two vouchers for the senior year, right? You have, you have to qualify <coughs> for a voucher. Everyone is not automatic. Oh no, sir. They so don't. what is the qualification? Um, yeah, ma'am. Oh. What school? Um, 
No, you, you know, I, 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 make sure I'm understanding this because I know we are free. Well, free, let me, let me free just lunch say, yeah, district. They, but they so, don't. They're not. I think schools have a certain number. It's not unlimited. It's not an unlimited oh, number of vouchers. Oh, so but I can I can get you that information. Yeah, please yeah, do I because I, we want to make sure that if a student is it has the if they qualify to take the ACT for free, and if the school is being limited on the number of, of vouchers, we got 300 plus students senior class. Hmm. Then we need to find out exactly how we can increase those vouchers for those students. I, I would think, sir. You know, I don't. I don't. But know. yes, sir. But okay. every student, you know, doesn't doesn't get okay unlimited vouchers with ACT. Oh no, no, no. They, I, they I know they get two 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 vouchers, right? Okay, so as I know, as a, there's a, there's well, a number. That not every student, though, is what I'm saying. Not oh, not okay. no. Every student doesn't doesn't get okay. two vouchers. All right, thank you. <laughs> Callaway High, mm -hmm. uh, under leadership, the goal was to maintain safe and orderly environment build a stronger working relationship between the school administration and the school leadership team. Uh, the strategy that was put in place for this past couple of weeks uh, met the school leadership team to create a state testing ca uh, schedule that corresponds with the uh, test security plan, make sure campus security is functioning effectively, which is a continuous piece that they put in their plan. Curriculum and instruction in order to teach test taking strategies and to tie up loose ends before state testing, teachers combine classes to form boot camps that afford the students the opportunity to benefit from two or three teachers. On the professional development, they provided training for teachers on the test security plan, take state testing practices and procedures. And for assessment, uh, the strategy was in order to teach test taking strategies and to top those loose ends before test taking, uh, teachers combine classes again to form those boot camps and having two or three teachers involved with the students in one group. Students were assessed <coughs> often to determine if they effectively used strategies on the assessment that mirrored uh, state tests. Those were the things that they engaged in at Callaway High School. Mr. Dockenheim. Thanks, Ms. Bird. Uh, again, thanks for that, uh, Dr. Stanton. I did just want to reiterate the point about making sure campus security is functioning effectively under leadership. Um, <coughs> I don't think that's really a leadership thing, per se. I think we're talking about leadership. If you have very strong leadership, that's very secondary to that. And so I, may, I know I raised that question way back when we presented this to MDE about why Callaway had that under leadership. Um, but it's, it's hard to continue to see it under leadership in this, in this manner, especially since it shows up similarly in climate and safety. I have a question. Mr. Jones. All right, thank you so much. Um, <coughs> as it relates to your comments in here, regarding uh, instructional uh, leadership, instructional capacity building for teachers. Would you mind giving a little color to that? Kind of, how did that, that, that go? Where, where are you reading from on this report? Yeah, from the, from the information y'all submitted. You said you said y'all you stated that, um, that you were using um, opportunities to uh, increase instructional uh, capacities for teachers as relation, you know, how, how does that, what does that look like? I don't see that in this report, but my, <coughs> my thought process on it would be, uh, as you know, we have the uh, academic leadership team from the district level that go out into the school as a result of the uh, information that's generated from uh, Dr. Sargent's team that, that go out and do the rapid response. So the the academic leadership teachers will go out to the schools and they will actually observe classroom instruction and then they would, from that report, they go in and model instruction in the classroom for the teachers in order for them to see how that look or how that uh, best practice look. And then they will observe the teachers to ensure that they are implementing those particular strategies in the uh, classroom. So that will help build the capacity for those teachers. Okay, how uh, was that? How did you, as being the, the person that's over, the that school falls under your preview, how did you ensure that uh, the meetings were, your FIT meetings or that uh, 
process that you just de de uh, described was being implemented with Fidelity? The first thing we do is, uh, as we come together as a group, we have the, and, and determine where we're going to go and what we're going to do. Uh, then we have the uh, leadership team, those teachers that will be going out to submit a calendar to us to let us know where you're going to be, whose class you're going to be operating in, what periods of the day or what blocks of the day you're going to be there. From there, we'll make the principal aware of it, then I would go out to the school spot checking in between. Not necessarily <coughs> telling them what school I was going to show up in, or uh, what period or what block I would be there, but I would go in along with the principals and walk through to ensure that we are doing the things that we say we're doing. After which, we would debrief with the principal, they would debrief with the teachers to, to ascertain whether or not they picked upon the things that needed to, that we were trying to do, and if they had any questions or needed any other assistance, or if we had some concerns, we being the person who went in and modeled instruction, they would share that with the teacher to ensure that they're able to get the assistance that they need. Thank you for the, for, <coughs> for the, for the um, and this is specific at Callaway, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, I just want to be clear on that. How, what were your results from those meetings then? How had that changed the, the, once you went through and assessed and, and provided feedback, what, how did you measure uh, the success from those meetings going forward at Callaway? There were two levels of measurement, if you would. One, let's go back to the initial one that caused us to go out there, and that's the rapid response team. Uh, whatever things they identify in there from their observation, uh, they schedule a time for to go back, the same team to go back and look to see if there's been any changes uh, that has taken place as a result of their initial visit. Uh, we do not know when that schedule is on the front end. So in between that time is when the academic leadership team will go out to the schools to provide the supports that are needed in order to meet those things that have been identified by the rapid response team. Then from there, the principals and the administrative team, they continue to monitor that along with the academic leadership team because it's not a, 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 a one-shot deal. <coughs> you go out there until you see that you're making a difference or that we need to do something differently. Then at the end of all of that, there's a time period where the uh, rapid response team will schedule to go back out and they'll go through their walkthrough again evaluating what they initially looked at to see if there's any difference, if there's a change, if there's not a change, and then they share the information back with the leadership team and with the leadership team at the school. And that's, that's this was it, 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 so you were actually involved with uh, feedback to the principal. Yes, sir. And, and you all uh, in those meetings were able to, to, to come up with a plan that was able to immediately be deployed with the teachers to, to grow the academic success of those students. And that was brought from the academic leadership team at the district level out of the curriculum office from that meeting. A plan is put in place based on what we see from the rapid response team. That's what we developed the plan from. And then from there, I've already met with the principal to talk about the things that's in the rapid response team's uh, report. The team go out and go into the classroom based on that report and then provide those supports that I mentioned. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Stanton. Thank you. Good evening to um, Interim Superintendent uh, Murray and Ms. Burt and the members of the board. Under 6B, uh, update for middle school location changes for school administrators for school year 17, 18. For information only, we would like for you to pull A1. <coughs> A2 should only be presented for information only. Okay, so we're pulling A2 and A1. We're pulling A1, A1. A2 will be presented for information only. Okay. All right. <coughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Ms. Burton, uh, Dr. Murray, members of the board, I present to you for your information and our action uh, the monthly financial report for the month ended May 31st, 2017. Uh, this is coming up on the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we are presenting to you your the budget status report, the statement of fund balance, uh, the bank <coughs> reconciliation report where all bank accounts have been reconciled within the required 30 days, and also the district maintenance cash flow report. Um, again, we are coming to the end of the fiscal year. We will have um, we do have some expenditures that happen that occur in July that have to come back to June. So as we have done in the past, we will bring this report to you again for June as preliminary, and then when we close out the the, the fiscal year, we'll bring a final report. Colleagues, motion for action. Let's move adoption. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the monthly financial report. Those in favor? Aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. We're now down to approval of JPS Code of Conduct Guide and Policy Handbook for school year 217 to 18. Who's doing it? Ms. Thomas. Come on. Ms. Thomas. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Interim Superintendent Murray, um, President Burt, and members of the school board. <laughs> it's my pleasure to stand before you today on behalf of student academic and behavior support as well as Dr. Wallace, our chief academic officer. Um, I would like to say that as we began this process for the Code of Conduct book, um, we made sure that it was a collaborative effort from school administrators. Um, central office administrators, advocacy groups, professional interest groups, teacher association, teachers, um, representatives from the community, our man up partners from Tougaloo, as well as a policy consultant. Um, the goal of this code of conduct book is to implement <laughs> a more progressive discipline process for our students. Um, in other words, as the behavior or infraction increases in severity, you will find that the level of response or the consequence will increase. The steps and responses provided on the chart in the matrix within the document um, provides the school administrators the appropriate steps or consequences um, when they are administering these particular um, incidents. Parental involvement is priority at each level. Thank you. Entertain a motion for action. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve a, a JPS Code of Conduct Guide for 217-18. Uh, Mr. Oppenheim, is your hand up? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, thanks. <coughs> Thank you for coming forward. I'm sure everybody said, oh, Mr. Offen, I'm just going to ask a bunch of questions, so I apologize. Um, I actually don't have that many questions, so I'll, I'll apologize to everybody who expects me to uh, ask a bunch of questions right now. Um, first, um, you know, thank you so much for the hard work that y'all are doing, because I know this is a heavy lift every single year. I know I'm a pain in the butt about this every single year, um, and a lot of it is because this is one of the most vital things to make sure that our young people in our schools and our educators feel supported within our school um, and with our community. Uh, and I go, I've gone back and forth with Dr. Wallace and Ms. Shepard about how we could think about this as like just completely starting over, right? Completely starting over, starting from scratch, because I think we, we tinker with it every year, and I think this year there's been a lot of progress. Um, but I think kind of in its <laughs> fundamentals, uh, you know, I would love to see us rethink this completely. Uh, there's districts all over this country um, that are using, uh, you know, apps instead of, uh, you know, a hard copy, very legalese um, uh, framework, um, you know, super simple. Um, because I'm always of the opinion that these are not really meant to be read by the community or by the young people. And so how do we get it to the point that it is kind of operational um, for young people and for educators? So simplify, simplify, simplify. Make sure it aligns with really the idea. Make sure our practices align with 
what we're trying to say through the positive behavior discipline practices. It's why I always hone in on uh, the security apparatus because I don't think they always align with what we're trying to say philosophically here uh, about how we value our young people. Um, uh, two, two specific things that I would like to, to ask, how soon and when, once we uh, potentially approve this, would educators be trained on the specifics of what's in this current document? Do we know? Uh, Yes, well, there, uh, our, ministry, our leadership teams, uh, we have a um, leadership training um, the week of uh, July, July 17th, July 17th, and this is day three. This, the full day is set aside for, day, day four, I'm sorry. Day four is set aside for the training. And this will uh, be principals, assistant principals, and members of the leadership team, department chairs, so they can come back and we can scale and be prepared to take this uh, into the building. Uh, and we hope to be able to provide it even before that uh, electronically. If you um, note, this is one of the, uh, this has come to you uh, very early this yep, year. Which is great. And it's very deliberate so that we can provide the training, so that we can put it in the hands of parents and students, uh, so we can uh, truly make it a document uh, that's supportive of students. And so yeah. that, that's our hope is that we can get it approved and get it in the hands of those who need it. Yeah, because I know one of the steep concerns that always happens, I always talk about how our policy has moved this way, but our training is really slow to catch up to mm -hmm. that. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's ever so more important, especially given the MDE scrutiny and all the other things that we're having to manage and deal with. So um, I'll definitely look forward to when those training happens. And then the other thing, too, that I think is really um, important uh, especially around due process is to be really clear because I don't think it's necessarily clear in our code of conduct um, in some kind of very visual way that says you know from the moment that this child has some issue that they're being suspended or whatever is the potential case how long it takes because I think that's where uh, a lot of families and young people get concerned because it's very confusing you're pissed off everybody's pissed off and you're kind of just reacting signing things if you are signing things and not really knowing your your rights and so um, I think it's really vital that we're very clear on, you know, timelines as it relates to, to this kind of stuff. And I think that should be present in some shape or fashion within um, the code, both <coughs> currently and going forward. And there's also plenty of people, uh, you mentioned a policy uh, analyst, yes. there's plenty of folks who will help the district do this for free. Mm -hmm. So I just yes. want to be. And, and, and we have, we again, in the document, we'll, we'll definitely make sure that that's the case. But we've been trained just recently, uh, Attorney Shepard's team trained our principals <coughs> on due process, a very deep dive into making sure that due process is there uh, for all students. So, so Mr. Oppenheim, you're probably not going to like this because we've talked about it before. But the, um, the policy that talks about boys wearing earrings, mm -hmm. I saw you said that's good. No, I said. I don't think that's good. And let me just say the reason why I think that boys should not be wearing so, earrings to school. So you said, let me, may I finish? Let me finish. Wasn't my point. You said that as long as they were, weren't uh, awkward looking or something like that. But let me finish. The reason that I said that on a very serious note is that our young people today, uh, if they wear earrings, uh, young men, and they try to find jobs, they, they're going to have problems. Now, the, fit, the, the playing field is not level to start with. So if we then uh, don't tell our young men that wearing uh, earrings to a job interview, uh, that there will be decisions made about this to you, whether it's right or wrong, there will be. So I just think that we ought not to support boys wearing earrings because it's going to have them, it's going to cause them to have problems later in life as they transition from being high schoolers to young adults if they don't make the change. So, so let me be clear about my point. The code does not say anything about boys <coughs> wearing earrings. Schools have a practice, and I've seen it multiple, multiple times, saying boys cannot wear earrings. 
that is an outdated homophobic assumption. It has nothing to do with homophobia. No, it does not. I, but that's where that's simply where it comes from. And, and I think if we're saying to, <coughs> to to girls and young women or whomever it is that as long as it's not distracting. But that's, who's going to determine that, Mr. Oppenheim, is what? whether it's distracting or not? That is a judgment that will have to be made. And it's usually a judgment based in homophobia. No, it I, isn't. No, it isn't. I think that you and I have different views on it because of the perspectives that we bring to the table. Okay. I have a question. I have a question. Yes, right, Ms. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Well, thank you so much. Um, as, as we look at this, uh, and thank you so much for, for the work that you have done, um, as we have looked at this uh, conduct uh, policy in the handbook and everything going along with it, as it relates to uh, this upcoming year uh, with the uh, proposed or, uh, or uh, uh, graduation standards that are, that are coming out you know, going forward, how does this you know, relate to those ninth graders coming in that may choose to go a career pathway or go uh, a traditional pathway. How, how, how does this speak to that, that, that fact? Um, what do you mean, the handbook? Yeah. Yes, because in here you talk about the, the you, you list, you know, the, the, the four different <coughs> tier, four different options, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, but again, again, as a freshman coming in, mm -hmm. okay, they're going to be under a different uh, set of uh, uh, of uh, uh, options. Yeah, they well, will they will not be able to choose. Mm -hmm. Well, what the code does is simply, or the handbook simply outlines what the options are. It's it's information, and so the the um, the communication with the parents and the students comes through their guidance counselor uh, when they make. The choice cards when they complete that that process that is done through that process but the, the book is just simply uh, information it's a reference uh, for parents uh, to utilize which outlines the different options but the actual uh, you know we, we don't expect a parent to, um, to to make that determination alone without the support of the school I mean they, they have the right to do that but we do have a counselors in place that can provide support as it relates to graduation options, uh, career pathways, and that's what our counselors will provide for them. Uh, our, eighth, our ninth grade counselors working with eighth graders before they come to high school and then the same process as they matriculate through high school. Uh, those counselors are working very closely with, uh, with them. Okay. <coughs> okay, so, um, all right, thanks. With, with that, so the counselors are going to be updated on uh, on, the, on this proposed, you on know, gra graduation requirements. Right. Yeah, oh yes, sir. The counselors. Okay. That's because again, their, it starts seventeen now. Yes, it starts seventeen, eighteen. Yes, sir. That's in, ter their, in, ter yes, in terms sir. of yes, freshmen sir. coming mm -hmm. in, <laughs> and so when we have it in print here in this in this format, mm -hmm. which does it lead to adjustments as it relates to uh, requirements that are going forth that are, ten that are being implemented this year? Yes, it, it, it does, Mr. Jones. Okay. There is a section that um, actually in Dr. Murray's letter, uh, cover letter in the document, that talks about how we anticipate the procedures and regulations will change and that once those changes are made, and of course if policies change, they have to be approved by you all, but uh, those changes will be placed on the website so that the parents can know that uh, there is a change. Okay, thank you for that. <coughs> also, you mentioned in your in your in your comments that you had uh, an array of uh, uh, individuals, different positions, to weigh in on on this on these documents. Mm -hmm. Okay, with with us um, observing that there seems to be a decline in uh, f female students and a, more of a rise in, in in male students. What changes did you make from a to, to it, adhere to that change in our demographics as a district? Or did y'all look at that? We did not, we sir. Did. That, that data set was not uh, presented to us um, as a trend, but we will definitely, um, you know, we'll definitely look into that. We, we didn't make any separate provisions for, uh, you know, looking at that data trend. Okay. But we, we'll, we'll look into that. We'll definitely look into that. Okay. If that, if that is a, uh, a trend that exists, we'll research that sure. and make any accommodations <laughs> that, that needs to be made. But of course, you, you know, we are very involved with, um, uh, we, with uh, Man Up, 
with the students of students of color, uh, our males of color. We have several organizations that work specifically to support that. So we are very proactive in helping our young men. Uh, if that is the the trend, uh, we're poised to be able to to deal with that. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. And where I gleaned that from was from these <coughs> these uh, uh, schools that are in this in, uh, improvement. Yes, sir. Yeah, and there are numbers in this show where there's a. a, a you know, going across there where there's more male students yes, sir. than female students. Yes, sir. So, yes, yes sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Those in favor? Those opposed? Mr. I'm, I'm Hoffman, do I see you? I'm abstaining. Oh, okay. One abstention. Thank you. <coughs> Now down to uh, consent agenda items finance. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Ms. Bird. <coughs> Dr. Murray, members of the board, I present to you uh, consent agenda items finance A through D. A, A is a approval of disbursements and accounts payable and activity fund claims for May 27th through June 9th, approval to dispose of surplus property, approval of the formal bid, which is to repair bar aluminum bar elementary roof and the approval of various donations um, with your approval I'd like to go ahead and read those please okay <laughs> to Watkins Elementary School from Love Ministry Inc $500 for general purposes as determined by the school administration various drums several drums <coughs> donated by the Cooper Band organization Ms. Elisa Hughes is president at a value of $949 for teacher appreciation at Forest Hill High School Five pizzas at $25 value at from Little Caesars by Miss Ross. 81 free taco coupons valued at $90 donated by Taco Bell. Two free dinner coupons and potatoes valued of $120 from McAllister's Deadly. Food from Sam's Club at $110 value. Six free dinner cards and food from value of $75 from Piccadilly, Mississippi. Um, other food, two Walmart gift cards, a total value of $100 from Sure Security, Mr. Danny Jackson of Jackson. Two boxes of donuts, a value of $15 from Monroe's Donuts and Bakery. Donuts, juice, and other items at a value of $30 from Betty Adams and Angel Dillon of Jackson. 180 pieces of chicken, $500 value from Double Quick of Indianola, Mississippi. Salad and other items from Olive Garden, valued at $600. Free menu coupons with a value of $2,800 from Outback Steakhouse. Free meal coupons from Zaxby's at a value of $510. Food for, from Walmart of Jackson at a value of $120 and goodie bags of supplies for, for teachers and a value of $600 for Comca from Comcast of Jackson. Wonderful. Ultimate. What was the occasion? Teacher for, appreciation. Teacher appreciation. At Forest Hill High School. Oh, okay. That was um, wonderful. We always thank our community partners for um, really, really helping with the various kinds of events that we have at our schools. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we... Um, Approve consent agenda items A through D collectively. Um, you want to ask a question about C? Yes. Okay. Um, <coughs> as it relates to the, the former bids, and, and thank you for what y'all do. Um, how? <coughs> when were the, the 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 information sent out, and how can we? I think we had a request of that earlier to, to get an idea of uh, the request for bids or what have you for particular projects of this size. How, how, how does that does that work to get a better feel for it is one question. The other question is, does, how can we go about as board members getting a copy of their or included in this packet, be electronically a, um, their proposal? to take a glance at it, to take take a look at it as we get into this piece here. Their actual proposals. Yes. Um, we looked at, I know Mr. Jones, we had started sending some of the RFPs, or the, the bigger ones that we have done, have been just emailing them to you because we do have them on the website, and they are posted as soon as they are public. Um, the construction bids are 
uh, voluminous. We get discs, and most of those discs the architects make, um, and there is a cost associated there. The responses a lot of times from our vendors are not electronic, they're plans and documents, but as much as we can scan to you, we'll get that information to you. A lot of times, especially with major construction projects, there are volumes of documents um, that perhaps if we see there maybe over 50 pages or so, we'll call you and you can maybe come down and take a look. I would hate to tie up your emails with a lot of that because a lot of that is, especially on the construction projects, a lot. But we will certainly do as much as we can and certainly contact you uh, as a group to come down sure. and take a look at it. Also, our bids are open. Our bid openings are open to the public and certainly at that point you can, um, we'll certainly give you that information. It's in the bid document sure. itself and the RFP <laughs> that you can certainly come and sit in and, and at that point you can look at anybody and everybody who submitted. Okay, great. Because uh, I know for me, uh, for all of us, I'm certain, is that uh, the more information that we have on the front end, it, it enables enable us to make more of a well-informed decision, have yes, concise, sir. you know, questions to, yes, to, to present. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. All right. Entertain a motion for approval. I think, I think it's already on the floor. It's already oh, you had it. Okay. Those in favor? Uh, Thank you. Thank you. We're now... Um, we didn't hear the motion. We did the motion. Oh, we did? You said the motion had already been done. So move adoption for second. those last four second. items. Second. Second. Okay. It's been moved and second that we adopt consent agenda items finance A through D. Those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. We're now down to consent agenda items general. Dr. Sargent. Approval of the district to district transfers. Can we take all of these together, colleagues? Would you check them, please, to see if you want to discuss any either way. Otherwise, we'll take all of them together. You have one. D, E, and F, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Where is Dr. Sargent? He's he? right there waiting. Yeah. Dr. Sargent. Good evening. Good evening. Um, which one do you have questions about? I'm sorry, I missed it. Um, Mr. Jones has a question about, did you say C? Uh, so D. D. D, E, and F. I don't know what we can take D, E, e and F. So would you just start with D? Okay. On the, um, the, the, I know that, I guess my question would be in terms of amending this uh, cons this. consulting uh, service with the Bailey Group, um, how what information do they provide to say uh, that their additional services re is required or needed for them to stay in the district? How, what type of report were you were you given? It was not a report. Mr. Ross and I just talked about it. Um, you know, I debriefed with them on a on a weekly basis, and then we just had some discussion about the contract and the you know we're anticipating getting a report back from the state, the preliminary findings uh, from the internal audit. Uh, due to the fact they just wrapped up. Um, we were informed that it usually takes about, they, they're given about a 30-day window to provide us with that preliminary report. So given that they finished maybe last week, uh, we probably wouldn't get that report to about this time next month. And so that's beyond the original timeline for the contract, which was June 30th. Uh, so we just had some conversation about it. We wanted to make sure that they were around to give us some techni technical support uh, when we get that uh, report back and also give us some assistance with the response. And they want to be around to provide that support. Uh, so we agreed and made a recommendation to Dr. Murray uh, that we extend the contract to August 31st. Okay, so they provided um, some some idea of how much time, more time they would need uh, to going forward, you know, with us in terms of working up whatever recommendations that that they've come up with and align with what our needs are. Well, well, more importantly, they wanted to make sure that they were still contracted with us when we get the investigative preliminary report back, 
because when we get that report, we're going to be required to submit a 30-day response to those findings. So they wanted to make sure that they were here to support us in that process. Okay. I noticed that I know that the um, <coughs> earlier comments in the training in the meeting with uh, the Bailey Group initially say that they would have a report uh, available, you know, for us. Um, uh, I, I uh, uh, we have requested that and, and I have yet to receive it. Okay. So uh, how do we? Um, go about getting that report, you know, by tomorrow, so we can kind of have a better idea of, of what's going on. Well, I think the um, the uh, board president uh, made a request that we do it in a uh, work session, and uh, we were, were just waiting for uh, the committee well, to, to roll that out. I, I appreciate that, but see, by us waiting, uh, I would assume, as in terms for us having information, mm -hmm. as we begin to have to. Um, go through this information in order to make quality decisions, mm -hmm. uh, even with this particular item coming before us, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have that information to, you know, to, to really take deep dives into uh, what they've come up with. And, uh, and I know for me, requesting on several occasions, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a bit, um, uh, because this cap plan is, is, is you know, um, it's, it's um, something that's very, very important and we need this in order to make quality decisions. Mm -hmm. So I, I would recommend uh, uh, that we have this, uh, I guess we can do it in a motion format to get this information, uh, for all of us to have this information, then I would like to do that. But I know that uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, we're, uh, the 24th will be a year that that, for, that, that uh, original uh, uh, information was sent to us. We've had a cap plan that's been out there for a minute. We've had consultants that we have paid to provide this information, mm -hmm. and we have yet to see the report of what their thoughts are. And so I'm just, you know, we're needing to really have, we need to make some major decisions here. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the information to do that. So when um, does this contract expire? June 30th. June 30th. And don't we have, a, we have another meeting on the 26th? Could we then provide that information and then act on it on the uh, 26th? Is the, that possible? The report? To um, and act on, yeah, have the report uh, prior to that time. But to act on it on the 20, act on this um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. item. Yes, because there are no, there the are no, yes, ma'am, we can, but there are no costs associated uh, with this no, uh, sir. adjustment. Okay. Uh, this is just an extension of the extension of the contract because the contract is ending. There's no additional uh, fee uh, that's being uh, asked for. It's just that we're, we won't be contracted with them after June 30th. And so in an effort to make sure that we're still on the contract with no additional cost, uh, it needs to be board approved to okay. do that. But the report, again, we, you know, the we stand ready to uh, provide uh, the report. Again, we had asked uh, that we provide because the report in itself uh, without any context, again, um, you know, we, we had talked about making sure that we uh, discuss those things in a work session. But again, if, if that's the will of the board, then we stand ready to provide whatever is needed. Well, I think that what happens is that if we do it at a board meeting, we really aren't going to have enough time to actually discuss it to the extent that we need to. <clears throat> so it might make sense to do it in a, in a work session. Um, so that uh, all the questions that members have can be um, answered. So, colleagues, is, uh, are you interested in a work session to have this done? I think that we would be amenable to a work session. However, again, we definitely need the information by, you know, I would hope by, uh, by 4 o'clock tomorrow we have this. And well, so that we, way can, we can. Uh, we'll we'll get the we'll ask the the superintendent to provide us with the information. I think the question would be when do you want to meet, and then uh, we'll ask the superintendent to make sure that he has that information to us ahead of time, sure. so that we can meet. Okay. So. Um, so then. Um, I know I don't have my calendar, but so if we'll ask uh, if somebody could just call tomorrow mm -hmm. and do a doodle or something uh, that we can decide on a time that we can do it, uh, that the members can meet. Is that satisfactory to everyone? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I have one question here concerning this amendment. So, in essence, um, this amend amendment 
allows them to continue Turn as a consultant, mm -hmm. but no additional funds will be mm -hmm. rendered, right. and um, our, our additional activities going to be pledged to be done for them, for us, on behalf of the Bailey Group. Yes, ma'am. They're, they're going to continue working. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why we want to extend the contract because there's there's some projects mm -hmm. uh, that requires their expertise and input. Mm -hmm. So okay. this extension only extends the partnership at no additional cost. And like we said, we anticipate getting the results back from the investigative audit. Uh, keep in mind, when they did the limited audit, it was only 22 standards. Our full investigative audit is 32. Exactly. And so having them having two individuals around that both worked in that department <coughs> when that report comes back, uh, to have to do a 30-day response that has to be submitted to the state, mm -hmm. it, it would be very helpful to have them available and their service available uh, when that report comes mm -hmm. back. And, yes. and one, one, one note, remember when, when we when, when we initially approved this, there was some conversation about what would transpire in the summer. And so again, uh, we anticipated the report being earlier, but it wasn't. So they've not, there's still uh, work to do and they're still, um, they're still available and amenable to working with us through the end of August at the same rate. And it's, that, it's, uh, it's not costing us any money, so um, mm -hmm. it, it seems like it would, for me, it would make sense to um, to extend it, they're still doing the work under the initial agreement for which we're paying. We're not paying them any additional money uh, for this. But when the plan, the responses come in, they're going to help to start working or uh, responding to that. That's right. So um, that seems to make sense for me. Mr. Jones. Yes, thank you. Um, one of the things that, again, uh, that, that we're uh, needing here is, first of all, in the contract, there seems to be uh, uh, some some an error in terms of at the bottom of it. And again, this is not opposition to to uh, the Bailey Group. What, the, what what again? The inquiry is about getting the information that was stated that we would have by the end of one week, and it's been uh, extended period of time. And I know that we have to make decisions such as this to know exactly what's been reported. You know, we don't know that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other piece of it is again going back to we're saying there is seems to be. Uh, um, an error, I guess, in the, the company that's listed down at the bottom of that contract there. Uh, was it Crichton? Yes, and we will correct that, Mr. Jones. Mm -hmm. we, we apologize about that. We will correct that and make sure that it's the Bailey Group. <coughs> Madam yeah. President, I yes. would just say we would just table this particular item until um, our next meeting, um, since there's no money to be exchanged, and it's an extenuation of contract, and we will still be under contract through the end of June. Mm -hmm. Well, they will the still be working contract. with us, so before we have our next meeting, it won't be June 30th. Exactly. So we can still make decisions then. Sure. Which is, that's what I was suggesting that we do. I agree to that. Colleagues, agreeable? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll entertain a motion for approval of consent agenda items A, B, C, uh, E, F, G. Well, actually, oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. No, 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 no. A, B, C. That's where we are, Dr. Sargent. Mm -hmm. Miss Webley is the next. Oh, okay. Is the next one. So that's not. And D, D. Yes. D is what's being held. Okay, okay. Until um, okay. next week. Mm -hmm. So I entertain a motion for consent agenda items A, B, and C. So move. Second. Moved and second that we adopt consent agenda items um, general A, B, and C. Those in favor? Aye. Thank you. And we will discuss D on our next, our next meeting. We're now down to approval of amendment for to consulting services agreement between Criterion Education and the Jackson Public Schools. Dr. Webley. Good evening, Good Dr. Evening. Murray, Madam President, members of the board, subject to your questions. Okay, thank you. 
Dr. Welder, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, President. Um, in here, we noticed that they're wanting to <coughs> extend the, the contract and make adjustments to the contract. What information um, did they provide in terms of report to show where this uh, recommendation is necessary going forward? It was actually our recommendation. This um, contract all began with the Schools of Promise. Initially, this contract was earmarked to serve Clausell, Blackburn, Wingfield, Isabel, Jim Hill, Wilkins, and Witten, the seven Schools of Promise. And with that initiative, we found that the contract was not serving a large number of people. It's a leadership development program is basically what it is. And what it does is it provides it's an extensive year-long leadership program for principals. Uh, NISL is a nationally renowned company. They've been around for decades and decades. And once they complete the leadership course, principals are afforded an opportunity to receive semi-credits and college hours as well they can work towards a, a master's degree or a PhD. So we have not had a program where we build our pipeline of leaders. So what we're trying to do is we are giving teachers who are aspiring to be leaders, uh, veteran principals additional training, new leaders additional training. So when we decided that we were not reaching enough people, the leadership decided that Forest Hill, it had a lot of challenges this year with um, statewide testing and what have you. So we decided that this would be a, an amazing program to bring in all of the new leaders, all of the new principals with the Forest Hill leader path theater pattern. So we wanted to offer the opportunity for that group of leaders to receive this intensive 24-day year-long program. And we are planning, if it, if it happens, that the following year of the third, the third year of the contract, we're going to offer the same services to the Callaway theater pattern, which will again capture more principals, capture more aspiring leaders, <coughs> and provide them an opportunity to go through a well-renowned leadership program. Okay. So with, based on their being in the district for a year going to School of Promise, because I, I thought that was uh, uh, debated or what have you, um, what recommendations or what information that they pre they, they presented, uh, Crichton, this group here presented, to warrant this type of recommendation? Yeah. What, I guess, where is the report to show that based on those schools that they uh, initially work with, right. have, we have seen uh, some form of? Well, actually, we're not done with the program. The principals are this particular cohort one. They have two more sessions tomorrow, and they have more sessions in July. So the initial doesn't provide you a comprehensive evaluation until at the very end of the program. So like I said, they're not done. They still have two more sessions to go through. This initial cohort does. And once they are done at the end of July, then NISL will provide us a comprehensive report on what the uh, what the training would it, would it, would it earmark. So at this time, we don't have a report because they're not done with the 24-day program. Okay. So how are we able to um, present this if we're unsure or have not seen Because of the historical reputation of NISL. NISL is throughout Mississippi, the United States. They have had amazing results with the leadership program. And like I said, we don't have a program in place where we can capture and build a pipeline of aspiring leaders. So this was a great opportunity to capture those classroom teachers who want to become <coughs> leaders. Okay. What, what, what type of information are they giving you? Are they giving you midstream reporting or something? Or are they just you everybody go through here? And you all just, you know, just take a look at it because I'm, I, I, there has to be some measurements in there or some matrix that are being used and seeing if they're being met mm -hmm. in order to, uh, in order for, for at least. Uh, for well, decision. normally we have not had a mid, a, a mid line, a mid point. That, like I said, normally the evaluations are done at the end of the program. Uh, we did not request that, but at the pleasure of the board, of course, we can request that um, to get that data, to get that evaluation. But let me also earmark that we had a lot of changes in the program. We had to halt the program at one time due to the, um, the legislative audit. So we had a... There were some challenges. There were a lot of challenges with uh, in implementing the program with fidelity. We had changes in leadership. We had to replace personnel. So NISL has not been able to give us a comprehensive report at this time. We requested it because we had not. We had some challenges on our part that we had to adjust and overcome. Yeah, and if I could provide some context for this, this, this was um, 
the previous administration entered into a three-year contract with NISL. Uh, and NISL was, again, it was designed to provide teacher training and leadership <coughs> training. Uh, they train 100 teachers through the TAIL program, mm -hmm. and they, they train a cohort of administrators. It's a year-long program. So there are very uh, detailed outcomes that are expected. But again, at the end of the program, the way the, the uh, mod module works is they're trained and then there's some deliverables. There's some expectations that they take this back into the school, the teachers and the administrators. And so again, the cohort one is, has not completed their first cycle. But we as a uh, leadership team looked at the Schools of Promise is, is no more. Again, so that in that structure, you know, there has, um, that was kind of disband the Schools of Promise. So we felt as though, uh, again, that was the, the previous leadership's um, program. And we felt that to best maximize this, we would put it in a feeder pattern. And so we approached them about making an adjustment to the way it was done because it was, it was all over. It was cross feeder pattern, <coughs> no feeder schools. It was mm -hmm. just, uh, again, I can't speak to uh, the, why the decision was made to do it that way. But again, it was our thought that if we could put uh, a consistent uh, group of administrators into the program, we could get a better bang for our buck. Again, because we are contracted with them um, they, for a three-year uh, cycle. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she, uh, how does this align with um, the, the uh, school improvement grant? Where, where, how does this line, this company, align with that? With that, which we. Well, actually, this is not a part of the school improvement grant. This is part of Title II professional development. Okay, I understand that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the question I'm asking is, we submitted a school improvement grant, so did we? Were we approved for that, or because no, we 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 were not. We were actually uh, we were not approved. But we will be submitting again. If uh, you may uh, know, just recently there is five million dollars left, so they will allow districts to resubmit, and we are, are working to resubmit in October. Okay, and I don't want to crisscross here because I was asking questions. We'll come back if I may, board mm -hmm. members, come back to that question so we can get kind of clear understanding of that. So we we have a program here that we did not uh, keep our end up in terms of these people coming in to work with us. I just want to make sure I'm understanding, okay? And uh, because of that, we wanted to extend the time um, to, to capture where we were not, uh, okay. All right, so, but we do not have any information relevant to uh, benchmarks or matrix or outcomes that we can actually put a, put a, some type of uh, reason to because we did not do our part no no sir okay. No, okay. there are deliverables mm -hmm. again uh, as uh, dr. Webley mentioned uh, that was not and when we set the program when the program was set up uh, it, that the deliverables were at the end of the year there are specific uh, criteria for completion once the program is finished just like different leadership institutes you go through the program at the end of the program it's, it's about changing behaviors, improving student achievement. So that data, the data will determine the results, but there is a report uh, at the end of the cycle. And so we've not extended anything. It's a three-year period. We're just completing year one. So what we've done is reorganized uh, the training as opposed to doing it with seven schools that were not necessarily in any kind of um, geographical area, we've aligned it with the structure of our district. We put it into a feeder pattern so that the, we can see the results of the initiative going all the way from pre-K up to high school in the same feeder pattern. So we just felt that that was a, a better use of our resources that we already had, that we had already committed to for three years uh, right. in the, with the previous administration. And Dr. Murray, mm -hmm. if I may add, mm -hmm. um, not only does it train the principals and um, a lead person in that building, it's also going to train 100 teachers within mm -hmm. the Forest Hill theater pattern. It's called the TEL, Teaching for Effective Learning. They're going to go through a three-day rigorous training, and they're going to be provided um, in coaching, modeling, and once they've gone through the training, the NISL <coughs> personnel, they come back to each of those buildings, and the teachers that have been identified to be in need of coaching or modeling, they're going to partner with those particular teachers and they're going to be within the building throughout the year. So that is a component of the contract as well, is to provide that intensive training for 100 teachers within a Forest Hill theater pattern. Okay, I understand um, that. And this is my last comment, colleagues, mm -hmm. and we'll move on, for me at least. Um, 
how do we know, or how do you all know, mm -hmm. um, whether or not they are meeting the deliverables that you all have outlined for them so we as board can see those deliverables have been met mm -hmm. with fidelity in order to make a well-informed decision. Yes, sir. The, again, and I think the deliverables are that they are, the teachers are, and the administrators are going through the training. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not a, a program where they are working uh, with um, like some of the vendors we've had, they're working in they're working in the building with teachers, uh, providing support for teachers on a regular basis, and then we did benchmark tests, and we can say these these the, we're getting results from this vendor because they're working with teachers on a regular basis. The model that it's we entered capacity. into the le it's a leadership academy or leadership training over a period of time so that we can grow our leaders and our teachers. So the data uh, that for us the deliverables are that they're actually conducting the trainings, that our teachers are going through the trainings, uh, that a leader, it's, it's valuable training, we're getting feedback from the teachers, uh, there are uh, surveys that come out of that, so of course we could provide that information to the board as an interim type evaluation, but ultimately at the end, what, what we will see in the schools will determine the effectiveness of the leadership program as well as the teachers, the kinds of results that we'll start seeing from those 100 teachers that are going through the three-day training and the administrators that go through that 24-day uh, institute will we'll have better schools. Dr. Lynn and then Ms. Sims. <laughs> yeah, uh, Ms. Turner, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, our policy states that before we reuse a consultant agency, we have to do an assessment on what they've done before. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So my question then, if we have not completed the three-year contract, we don't know if they did what they were supposed to do mm -hmm. in the first place. Right. Is that, is that accurate? Well, we know that when it was just earmarked for the schools of promise, this program, it's a leadership capacity program. Right. So even had we been able to do everything on time, I don't know if we would have the exact results that you're asking for because it builds capacity over a period of time. You know, we have a lot of new leaders in the school. They right. have the, the title of principal, but do they necessarily understand what leadership is, what it means, what it, in, right. what it entails. This company, its reputation is stellar. Yeah. You know, it has, uh, it has produced amazing leaders throughout the United States, throughout the world. So even though we don't have the concrete data that we would like at this point, we're confident that this company will be able to help us build the capacity within our buildings that we need. And initially, as Dr. Murray stated, this concept began with the Schools of Promise. The Schools of Promise are no longer. So we have a three-year contract where we were only serving a small number of leaders. And then we have a lot of aspiring leaders, a lot of aspiring teachers who need this leadership training if they're going to become leaders. Yeah, I, I, and I don't, I don't have any doubt about mm -hmm. that. That's, that's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm saying what policy says. And our policy states that if we reuse another consultant or a, the same consultant, we have to do an assessment on what they've done in the past to make sure that we get our bucks for our bang. That's all I'm saying. So in the past, I'm not so sure if we've, if we've done a good job of that. Mm -hmm. My concern is if we're going to spend that kind of money, we gotta, we got to ensure that we're getting our dollars. But there, there's no guessing. We can't guess at it anymore. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to spend the money, mm -hmm. we got to guarantee that we're going to get something out of it. And to this date, we don't know. It's in this particular instance, mm -hmm. we don't know uh, because we haven't we haven't spent the three years on um, getting the information before we decided that we want to go back to them. So uh, I guess, Dr. Murray, my question would be to you is to make sure that in the future that we we are following that particular policy mm -hmm. so that we can ensure that any consultant that we're reusing mm -hmm. that we know that they've been beneficial to the district and we got what they said that they were going to give us oh yes sir well we we've the board has been very clear on that and we provide uh data when we bring someone back and we have that conversation with uh vendors that again we will be looking at the data and the board will be looking at the data when we bring something uh, up 
a contract but, back because so, we've asked this, this board has asked I know I have but mm -hmm. several times mm -hmm. I wanted to see where we were on consulting and, and the results and, mm -hmm. and we haven't been so I, I agree that we that we are to um, to have this information but this sounds like that this is a commitment that's already been made yeah. it sounds like it's a three year commitment a contractual three year commitment and it seems as though they have turned what was a program that wasn't working into a program that will work, that will still build capacity. Uh, and clearly, since the schools of promises don't uh, no longer exist, if they were able to then repurpose this in a way that gets us newly developed leaders, then it seems as though that makes sense. We have this commitment, and it sounds like we got to make it. We got to we got to um, uh, honor this commitment, and this is clearly a better way to uh, to look at it instead of saying, well, the schools of promises died and so what now? It seems as though they've made some good recommendations as to how we ought to be able to move this along. And I agree that from, and this seems like an extenuating circumstance where it wouldn't be one of the ones where they're just bringing up a new contractor to say, okay, we don't have any results from this contractor, so now we want you to use them again. But it seems as though this contractual relationship that is now is going to be three years, which is now only one year. Is that right? We're Into completing the first completing year. one first year. year right? So you don't have any information that you could could even give to determine whether in fact you would go further with it or not. So I don't know if we have any choices. Yeah, so is this a new contract? Is this a continuation it's of a the continuation. contract? It's a continuation. So mm -hmm. it's a three year so, contract. So the, the contract was initially written for three years for the schools of promise, but with that initiative no longer being in existence, this was our option to be, to be able to better serve schools that were in need of it and to be able to build our pipeline of leaders. Because right now, the, that, that initiative is gone. It's, it's, not, it's not viable, but we were still in this two year plus obligation with NISL. So the leadership sat down and we brainstormed and we were looking at the different feeder patterns and we were looking at the results of the Forest Hill feeder pattern and the, the change in leadership and we felt that that feeder pattern at this time would benefit from this leadership training to help build capacity within that feeder pattern. So that was the purpose of us bringing it back and to be able to serve more leaders, to be able to build capacity, to be able to give other administrators opportunities to get a refresher because it is an amazing course. Um, administrators, hundreds and hundreds of administrators throughout this state have gone through this training and it has yielded amazing results in building leadership capacity within the individual schools. Okay, so so I, I was thinking that it was a new contract. No, sir. So, no, so sir. just no. amend it. Yes, no, sir. sir. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Ms. Sims. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Webley and Dr. Yes, Murray, um, I understand the schools of promise are, are not with us at this point, but um, if we could get some sort of interim report, um, if you're training 100 um, teachers, um, the participation, <coughs> some sort of survey, how they felt when they went back to their schools, implemented the um, skills in their schools, and we get some sort of assessment to know how they mm -hmm. implement that phase of that. What we're looking for are some results on right. dollars spent. Yes, and I understand the, the deliverable is a result, but we want to know if we um, take 100 teachers, mm -hmm. employ them with new skills, we would like to see are these skills working yes, in this feeder pattern. And that's a short-term result that we can build upon and maybe extrapolate it into the entire district if these skills are working. Mm -hmm. But that's where I'm looking for some sort of interim report. Mm -hmm. Since it is a three-year contract, we don't want to go three years and say, oh, well. Okay. No, we want to use what we got, work it, and if it's working <coughs> well, then we can give feedback to the consultant. Right. This is working well, this is not working well, because mm -hmm. we're evaluating what we're doing, and we know what we're asking of them so they can um, develop the program yes, for our critical needs with uh, younger teachers, mm -hmm. younger administrators, mm -hmm. and then these administrators. My question, my second question is, mm -hmm. since we know what schools are working with, mm -hmm. 
we switch around administrators throughout the district, are we going to keep these administrators with this program, with this feeder pattern, for these two or three years so we know the results that we're getting from this feeder pattern? They've been trained. They're staying in this career path, so we should have better schools, better teachers, <coughs> and better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are, are we saying that to our administrators that come into this program and start with this? Yes. I guess that's what I'm, well, I'm trying well, to understand. Yes, well, the, the entire, this whole organizational shift is about providing supports uh, as needed and not having a cookie-cutter approach to the district. And so with, with NISL in Forest Hill, it's our hope and our plan to keep those administrators in that feeder pattern, to keep those 100 teachers in that feeder pattern so we can clearly see systemic change throughout that feeder pattern. Exactly. And that's what, the, that's what the program is about. It's about training teachers. They have four or five trainings, and then they're supposed to go back into the school and some coaching takes place and then we look at the data and see if changes take place. So we, we can definitely provide that, that kind of um, uh, information for you yes. uh, to, to, to let you know on the surface how it's working for teachers. We may not have the quantitative data from test scores well, we should, at this point, yeah, but we, we can provide, we oh yeah, exactly, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the way the model is designed you train and then you you should see better administrators yes okay. and better teachers yes mm -hmm. that's that's what we're and which for. is which is our issue we have to improve uh, our teacher core uh, if we're going to improve student achievement and mm -hmm. so this is directly in line with improving our teachers uh, providing the PD that they're asking for and providing the support for our administrators that's the only way our students are gonna are going to be able to get what they need is if we have teachers who are qualified you know and ready to, to deal with the issues that exist in the classrooms. Mr. Abenheim. Yeah, thank you, um, and thanks for bringing this. And I echo my colleagues' sentiments. My, my only other suggestion, which I've made over the years, is um, uh, it, what would be really nice, because the concern about the consultants always comes up, including especially about what kind of data are we getting to show where they're at. Some kind of consultant, almost like an organizational tree so that we could see who's working in what schools so that then we could be doing much more clear math, so to speak, about how those schools are performing, what kind of investment is being put into them, um, you know, whether it's Kirkland, Green, Bailey, uh, Nissel, whomever it is, so that there's a very clear picture because that paints a picture, and I think that would be really helpful um, to put together. So. I'd be very interested in receiving something like that, and I'm sure my colleagues would be very interested in receiving yes, something. Yes, sir. And, and this, uh, this structure will help us do that because it is in a feeder pattern. It's, it's clear. This feeder pattern outpaces other feeder patterns by 15 percentage points, then we know there was some value added somewhere in that feeder pattern. And so that's what we're, we're trying to do to make sure that we can put things in a way where we can really quantify the, the, the success or lack of. And so that was the purpose of reorganizing the NISL uh, model for this feeder pattern. And well, that's why we're bringing this to you all for approval. Mm -hmm. Dr. Murray, mm -hmm. I think that goes back to what we have been um, admonished with the Mississippi School Board Association mm -hmm. as you give us our um, school picture, card, school mm -hmm. card of, mm -hmm. of the schools. Mm -hmm. What Mr. Oppenheimer is saying, mm -hmm. alongside of that, we know what resources, what additional resources hmm. we're putting idea. in to each school. Mm -hmm. So we'll know um, the additional resources, where they applied, and then we'll be able to score that school right along with the additional uh, items that we're putting there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Well, as for our motion for approval. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve consent agenda items general E. Those in favor? Those opposed? One opposition. Okay. All right. Dr. Webley. Approval of a consulting services agreement between the Kirkland Group LLC and the Jackson Public Schools. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> The leadership is asking for the board to approve this contract. What this contract entails is this training of the trainer model. Um, recently, well this past school year, this early fall, we purchased 
the C3D documents from the Kirkland Group, they are curriculum documents, pacing guides. And we were in need of these curriculum pacing guides to see where we were in align to align with the state assessment. And the teachers and the leadership team in the curriculum department have been working with these um, documents throughout the school year since early fall. Well, as we progressed during the spring and we were to reevaluate, we were reevaluating where we were and what we needed and get, seeking feedback from the teachers, we conducted a, uh, a focus group to see what the needs were. Dr. Sargent and the leadership team conducted a focus group of 10 teachers to see exactly what our needs were. Was this a beneficial document? How did it help you? Did, was, it, was it useful? Was it not useful? What, what did it do? You know, seeking the feedback that you all have asked us to do. And we felt that this approach was a better approach because we were actually able to get live feedback from the teachers in a group of veteran teachers who had worked this document during the, um, during the fall. And what the teachers um, basically stated was that the documents had some good points, it had some bad points, but most of the feedback on the documents were but they were very positive documents that it really assisted them in the classroom. It aided in helping them unpack the objectives, the curriculum, all of the things that teachers do within the classroom. So this was a very, very engaging conversation, a very engaging way for us to, um, in fact, we had not done it in this manner, to conduct feedback and to really get a real live view of what the teachers are thinking and feeling. So based upon this focus group evaluation, they made a lot of suggestions within this meeting, and they, um, they want to continue with the document, but the document needed some tweaking. There were things that the document did not address that they felt that we needed within the classroom to provide those additional supports. And so we took that all into consideration, and we also took into consideration the board's um, express interest that we stop relying on consultings as much as we have. So even though we are presenting a contract, the purpose of this contract is called the trainer of the training model, where we're going to actually train our people to be able to deliver the curriculum, the pacing guides, all of the supports that our teachers need within the classroom to be successful. So we are seeking approval for this contract for our curriculum team to be able to work with this document in greater detail to take the feedback that was gained from the focus group and to be able to provide the teachers the supports that are needed within the classroom. Mr. Jones. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to, to make sure I'm understanding mm -hmm. um, um, that, ex you know, your overview or summary of um, this consulting uh, contract, we have not or did not, as a district, uh, prepare our pacing guys or break down information that, that has come down from the State Department. So we hired, or you all consulted with Kirkland Group to, to prepare pacing guys, materials, and everything else for teachers to use. Uh, that, that's, that's somewhat, um, um, some of that is, well, let me just kind of clear that up. The, our curriculum department has, has compared, we have to have pacing guides and curriculum for every student at every level. So what our current curriculum department has done and is doing right now is working on curriculum documents for K through 12, science, social studies, uh, all of the uh, foreign languages, every, every pacing guide that uh, we have to have in this district with the exception of ELA and math. Uh, and as Dr. Webley has mentioned, back in the fall, uh, the district um, w had the uh, Kirkland document, and with that, we had in having conversation with teachers, we and we saw in our budget uh, meeting that we're fully staffed now uh, in our curriculum department. At the time when we had to make decisions about moving forward, we were not. So we made the decision as a leadership team to say. Uh, we're not going to do this to our teachers. We're not going to change documents every year. Over th the last four years, we've had four different documents. So we're going to stay here with this document for next year, and then moving forward, as the board has uh, has requested, that we build capacity within our district. Uh, if you look at this, this is relatively small compared to some of the uh, the contracts that we've had in the past with vendors across uh, across different areas. But the purpose of this is this train a train a mod model will allow 50 of our teachers to be trained so the reliance won't be there. They'll be able to train on the, the, the uh, document. Moving forward, we have the capacity now within the department 
to be able to uh, do our own ELA, our own math. We've actually started that work uh, moving forward. But when the decisions have to be made, uh, again, we made an informed decision from where we were at, at that time and from the feedback from our teachers. Uh, we hear from the teachers. You know, the teachers say to us, you know, we, the documents are changing. We're getting them late, you know, so it, we have to be proactive as opposed to reactive. And this is our way of being uh, proactive. And we're asking for this training to get at what the board has asked us to do is to uh, get away from reliance on, on consultants. I, four years ago, I heard that that comment and every year uh, we've decreased that and this year is a very 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 small amount that we're asking for approval of in order to continue to move down the path of self-reliance uh, from the curriculum standpoint okay um, so again the question is in terms of um, uh, at this point documents are not ready to give to the teachers and we've already finished the school year uh, first question this, are they ready? Have they been deployed to the to the teachers um, to for them to uh, digest, get ready for August, which is about 45 days out? Okay. The other question is is that um, so Kirkland has done this workforce. What have we or what have your staff? What has your staff have done to uh, get this done? Because again, questions and comments in reference to uh, curriculum. Yeah. Questions and comments as it relates to what we were cited through the uh, uh, le legislative audit mm -hmm. have come up, been coming up, and that we, I know I specifically, as well as the other board members, have inquired about where are we mm -hmm. with ensuring that information is being provided. Mm -hmm. And it seems that um, that information has been um, um, still being in, in, in the works with the outside person, not our own person. People are developing these, mm -hmm. these um, programs. So uh, that's the second question. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are our people doing? Again, uh, our people are developing curriculum. The ELA and math are two, two content areas among many uh, in, in, in the district. So there are, again, documents all the way throughout the entire continuum from uh, kindergarten all the way up through high school for every subject. So we have, we still have science. We have middle school. We have elementary. We have biology. We have, uh, we have other math courses that are not. Uh, we have uh, trig. We have pre-cal. We have other. So the curriculum department is working on those documents. All of those documents will be available for teachers after June 30th. That, and that's a, uh, that's every course. The state requires us to have curriculum documents and pacing guys available for uh, for our teachers. Again, Kirkland uh, is not their document. It's our document. The feedback from our teachers, uh, working with our team, putting together a document, they're simply providing support for us in an area where we needed support. The document, uh, the document for Jackson will not look like any other document uh, in the state. Uh, we gave them specific directions on how we wanted them to spiral different things for us, uh, how we wanted them to add uh, um, uh, sample materials to it. This is what we've uh, asked them specifically for, which looks different from the, the basic C3 document that they might have in another district. So they are working with us in partnership, uh, and we are developing the document. They are helping us develop a document that our teachers uh, uh, have provided input on, uh, have focus groups on and so they will also but is what they are cre making the creation so again they're going to provide the training for 50 of our teachers and our teachers will be the ones that will deliver the training to the the 50 teachers will deliver the training to the other um, 500 or so teachers uh, in the district in these areas along with all the other curriculum documents or uh, training when they provide the training on uh, the, the week of July 24th. So again, we are working collaboratively with uh, Kirkland. They're not creating something, giving it to us. Uh, we're working with them, and and we're working to make sure we don't have we don't have to rely on anyone else in the future. They're providing support like many of our other vendors uh, do for us throughout the district, where we have uh, some areas where we need uh, some uplift. Okay, and so uh, the State Department puts out these uh, mm -hmm. curriculum. Um, um, standards, mm -hmm. pacing guides, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, the training that the uh, originators have put out mm -hmm. uh, was, 
we do not see benefit in going to or having our people be trained by MDE to prepare these 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 documents. Or yes, this, sir, this information. Yes. Well, we have curriculum people. That's training going on as we speak today. Okay, actually. I'm just talking about in reference to okay. uh, reference to uh, if it's math, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, they have trainings and so on mm -hmm. that they provide for. Uh, um, the, you, your term unpacking to provide pacing guys lesson plans in our people or your people mm -hmm. people in the district mm -hmm. that are in these key areas mm -hmm. um, was not a part of afforded opportunity to go to those types of training or or so we solicited uh, the Kirkland group to prepare the same documents information that the State Department well, trains on Is well yes sir we, we have people at the training but for, for example uh, in the middle school you know, we had, uh, and this has been for the last couple of years. Uh, we have we have four vacancies in, in the curriculum office. Uh, at the high school, we had two or three vacancies uh, again, and uh, pulling teachers and not not an excuse, just reality. We have vacancies, so when you have to make a decision as to how we move forward, you know, you don't assume that we're gonna get people, we're gonna have people in place for the summer. We made a, a decision back in the fall that we would go with this document for another year. We would provide uh, information, feedback to Kirkland, and we would have them tailor the document for us. So the decision was made several months ago before MDE trainings and all of that, that we would go back with this document because teachers had said to us very clearly that they were they wanted something in their hands so they could prepare as opposed to not knowing what they're gonna get you know, uh, from year to year. And so that was our commitment to not change the document this year. That's why the decision was okay. made to stay thank, uh, thank with you. Kirkland for one additional year. All right, thank you so much. The other question I have here is, mm -hmm. um, it seems based on uh, information, or historical information with the Kirkland group, mm -hmm. they were providing guidance or support in areas in this before we received that um, uh, uh, review of our legislative, I got the feedback from that, correct? I'm sorry. I they, uh -huh. The Kirk group was in, in the district before uh, we got the feedback on the legislative audit in terms of where we um, did not meet or were not meeting uh, certain standards. Correct. Uh, yes, they were. They were in the district yes. serving as uh, okay. as lead okay. partners working with teachers okay. on. Yes. Okay. They were so the based on that, and and we've yielded the result that we have been in the process of having to prepare a cap plan and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, where where is the value? Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's some data that uh, that exists uh, from uh, that, uh, uh, some clear data that shows that there has been success at some schools. I think on the data set I looked at, six of the uh, 12 schools that they worked in, I think they increased the letter grade, um, and so they they the schools um, that were priority and the schools that were at risk. Uh, they worked in some of those schools, and there has been uh, some value, and there's been some other schools where there's not been uh, a lot of progress. But again, this is that work was specifically uh, working with teachers uh, in buildings, um, uh, coaching, and things of that nature. This is a this is the same company, but this is a different um, this is a different. Um, pro product that we're expecting from them. We're not, they're not in our district anywhere working uh, in schools uh, with teachers. Again, this is project, uh, product development, curriculum development, and so this is what we are, uh, again, what our teachers are currently using in ELA and math. Uh, they they're, uh, will be making revisions to that product if it's approved by the board, and then again, our teachers will have a document that they uh, are familiar with, uh, it will better uh, provide the support for our teachers for this year, and then moving forward, we will our curriculum department is fully staffed with 18 to 20 uh, individuals, and we'll provide our own curriculum from K-12 in every area. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other, uh, Mr. Offenheim? Yeah, thank you, um, and I uh, appreciate this. I appreciate the effort to reduce consultants because I know I've probably voted against Kirkland the last couple of times they've come in front of us. You know, given that this is a much smaller amount and that it's a trainer of trainers, which I think has been suggested over and over again, you know, thank you for that effort on this. My comment is, uh, I mean, it's really just a comment that, um, you know, for the amount that we have invested, and I guess it might be a little bit flippant to say, but um, uh, I was thinking to myself, we may as well hire somebody 
right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the intention because we have that department, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know if it's this person, but, mm -hmm. you know, or somebody from there, but like, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to go down the path of having to keep on do this. So I'm glad we're moving away from that. Um, but, you know, we could have just hired somebody a long time ago. And I know that's not on you or you, Dr. Webley, um, to be able to do what we're now intending to do with another contract. <coughs> Yes. I have one comment, please. As we, uh, the 50 teachers that are going to be trained, yes. and our 500, I, we just need feedback hmm. so we know if what they're doing is working. We don't want to get to an end of a contract and evaluate. We need some mid-range evaluations that you know that it is working. And of course, um, since we do have a curriculum department, we need to see, of course, best practices, mm -hmm. what's working, and incorporate that for next year. But um, if we're training the 50 teachers, mm -hmm. we need to, is this in one feeder pattern? How is this oh, gonna this be is, a part this, of the these, these teachers, these are, these are teacher leaders in the building and all of the curriculum department, everyone in the curriculum department. And they we have a training set for this summer for an entire week. Okay. And these teachers will train our teachers. So our teachers won't be trained by Kirkland. Our own, the teachers, our teachers, teacher leaders will be trained. Okay. But our teacher leaders will train the teachers that are on the ground in the schools. <laughs> and is the curriculum department a part of the people that's gonna be trained? They are, yeah, oh yes. They're the, the 20 curriculum individuals and then teacher leaders in buildings that right. they've identified okay. that can help them do the work. It looks yes. like we are headed toward train the trainer. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, that's good. Uh, I'll entertain a motion for approval. So move. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve the consultant services agreement between the Kirkland Group and Jackson Public Schools. Those in favor? Those opposed? One. Okay. Now down to memorandum of understandings between Smiles to Go and Jackson Public Schools. Dr. Armstrong, come on. So move. It's been moved. Second. And second, that we approve a memorandum of understandings between Smiles to Go and Jackson Public Schools. Those in favor? Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to say a word. <laughs> All right. Smiling as she I know. Goes. That's why she's doing <laughs> smiles to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Approval of final contract adjustment uh, order number one roof replacement for Rowan Middle School. Ms. Robinson. Can we do it again? I guess not. <laughs> I will entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we uh, approve the final contract adjustment change order. Number one, roof replacement for Rowan Middle School. Questions? Those in favor? Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Okay. Approval to renew insurance policies for school year 216 through 18. Mm -hmm. Entertain a motion for approval. Should that be 2017? Yes, it should be 2017. Mm. Uh, no, 18, 17, 18. Yeah. Entertain a motion for approval. So move. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve the renewal of insurance policies for school year 217 18. Questions? Those in favor? Thank you. We're now down to consent agenda items personnel. Yes. Approval of staff personnel uh, matters. Ms. Lyons is on the way. Move for adoption. <coughs> Excuse me? Did I hear move for adoption? No, 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 no. Ms. Sims has some. Let's get it on the floor first, and then we can uh, discuss it. Entertain a motion for adoption. So move. Um, it's been moved and second that we approve staff personnel matters. Questions, Mr. Oppenheim? Uh, thanks, Madam President, and thanks for.
coming forward. Everybody else got off a little bit easy just now. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, so I was just responding mostly to the question about um, that I had previous to the board meeting about why are licenses expiring, who's keeping track of this, all that. Um, and one of the comments was that um, HR sends out blasts to employees to remind them to update their licenses. Is there something more comprehensive we could do than, and maybe there is something more comprehensive we could do, but an email blast or whatever that might entail just doesn't sound like it's really like the nudge that an educator might need to. Mr. Oppenheim, uh. you know, it seems to me <laughs> that if you are an adult human being and you know your license is expiring, mm. it is on you yes. to make sure that it is expired, that it doesn't expire. Yeah. Why do you need anybody to help you? That's we, that's, that's just doesn't make any sense to me. Remind you to, of your livelihood? <laughs> I don't think so. But if, if I could, if I could speak to something uh, again, I I, I agree. It, it is up to the professional to make sure that the license uh, does not expire. But we are, uh, Dr. Armstrong, uh, mm -hmm. she's, we we are working on a system, putting a system in place by which we will be able to track, uh, not track, but we'll be able to keep up with the, the hours and the credits that teachers uh, secure each year. There'll be a requirement, and so it'll be a prompt. So they'll know I have this number of hours. So it'll be another uh, piece to help prompt them that their license might be about to expire. So we have a, a systematic approach to that through a system that we're going to put in place. And we'll be going back to making sure that, that and by policy, teachers are required to have a certain number of hours per year. That way they don't get to year five and have to try to take the summer yeah. to get five credits. So we'll be working on that, and that's something that will be coming before you all very shortly. And I, and I, and I appreciate that, because um, I know last year when the issue came up when suddenly we lost a bunch of teachers mm -hmm. to the licensure issue, real, mm -hmm. there were some, um, I think, suggestions made to how we could be on top of that more. And yes, while I agree an adult, a professional should be on top of that, I think as a district who needs teachers, we also have to be very pushy about that. So yes, I think that's really important. Thank oh, yes, you. Yes, sir. We, we will be. We will be, uh, again, through through this uh, program. And the program will also provide opportunities for teachers to take get credits within the system. So uh, we'll make it very uh, accommodating for teachers. That's good. Anybody else? Those in favor? I have questions. Mm -hmm. Those, oh, you have questions yes. prior to? Okay, well, ask your question I mean, before we vote. I have questions. Uh, are we voting on the entire slate here? Do you want to pull something? Yes, yes. Okay, yes, yes. why don't you give them to me? Okay, let me identify them. B12. B12. B is in boy, Bravo 12. Okay. I'm looking for the other one. B12 van. I am looking for the other, uh, is it the area? Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. F3. F3. Okay. Anyone else? All right. So I'll, um, we're. F and F4. F4. Okay. So those in favor of approval of staff personnel matters with the exception of B12, F3, and F4. Those in favor? Thank you. Ms. Sims, are those you want your particular persons? Yes, I okay, think so. actually. Um, okay. Don't, don't tell me, but we'll have to have yes. an executive session for that. Okay. Yes. Two old business or new business. I have a question. Uh, other business? Yes, We're here there. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. Thank you so much, Madam President. Um, in our earlier comments, that was a question in reference to the school improvement grant. Um, I'd like to get a little update on that. 
Yeah, well, the, the school improvement grant, um, the, what, the group that was working with us, you know, of course they came to us. Uh, there was a, um, the grant was submitted, but it was, I'm sorry. Grant was submitted, but it was uh, the day of, but it was tardy. It's what we found out. The, there was a cutoff at 3 o'clock. It was received after uh, that. So the grant was, of course, excluded because of that. Uh, I guess the, the, um, the good thing for us is we feel like there uh, is a quality grant and the state did not expend all of the funds. So we basically, uh, we, we talked today with the... Um, with uh, Dr. Merritt and the group uh, that we'll be working with, we'll be resubmitting uh, either four or three of those grants, uh, and we hope to be able to secure uh, those grant dollars. Okay, so to, to make sure I'm understanding you, mm -hmm. we uh, did not get the we we did not get the grant there on time. Uh, yeah, it was yes, sir. It was not submitted. It was not, it was the deadline was three o'clock. And it okay. was uh, anything that was received after that uh, was uh, was not accepted. Okay. 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 It, 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 okay. Let me. It, it, we we have schools that are um, in dire need of support, particularly free support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have you have a staff. Mm -hmm. um, you and your staff. Mm -hmm. um, to me, in my mind, just put these uh, students. You put these teachers. Mm -hmm. put these parents, you put these communities, mm -hmm. what are they going to do? Because we are, one of the key things that have come out is that mm -hmm. we do not operate with a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. And so when we have to go down there and, and, and meet with our regulators, our funders, mm -hmm. and we are uh, second largest district with all the help, PhDs all over there, Mm -hmm. And we have contracted with a person we approved as a board, and this information did not get turned in on time. Mm -hmm. Who lost their job? Um, I know you probably can ask that question. Excuse me. <laughs> um, uh, uh, some, some, something. Something. Uh, no, I, I am. I am very, very concerned mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. the only ex explanation for us not getting this money in, uh, not getting this money to our schools, is that we didn't get the information out on time. Mm -hmm. That's that's um, that's that's very concerning. That's that's my comments, y'all. Yeah. I agree. That is concerning. But just know that uh, mm -hmm. when you submit a grant, it doesn't guarantee that you get it. But I agree that it certainly should have been submitted. But submission doesn't guarantee that you will receive it. It's competitive. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But at the same time, when we are uh, in a position that we're in, and we do not give ourselves the opportunity to have them to tell us no. Mm -hmm. because we didn't have our stuff there mm -hmm. that's a different kind of conversation mm -hmm. yes and we are having that conversation uh, again that's that's the responsibility of um, uh, um, that you all charge me with is having that conversation we we've, we've had that conversation again and um, you know it's it's a privilege to be able to do business with uh, with the district uh, and so again when you know, again, we've had we've had the conversation, and we will continue to have the conversation. But again, I think it's important to note that the opportunity still exists, and we have the grants, uh, and we will submit the grants. And we feel confident that we have probably uh, some of the best grants in the state, and we, we feel confident that we'll we uh, will have a good chance of approval. Well, so again, that, that does not excuse the the tardiness right. uh, of that, and we're not we're not making an excuse for. And I'm not not going to definitely make an excuse for a contractor. Right. But again, it's our responsibility to deal with with that. And uh, but again, we do we will resubmit the grants uh, in October. There's five million dollars still out there. Uh, and uh, again, as we stated uh, back then when it was brought to you all, the grants are quality, uh, uh, and we, we feel that they will be in good well, shape uh, to present those. Well, we understand that, and we also understand, too, mm -hmm. that they provided webinars, they provided feedback, called us, and asked us to uh, submit this information and so well, on. Well, they, they, they didn't call us. Well, well hi yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, they, well, they didn't call me. I don't know. My concern they, now yes, is mm -hmm. what are those students mm -hmm. are going to do? What yes, are those sir. teachers going to do? That's that's the my, that's that's the main concern, particularly when we find ourselves mm -hmm. in a situation where we need all the support and all the the free money we can get, but mm -hmm. we're going to pay. Uh, looking at contractors coming in here mm -hmm. with X number to provide mm -hmm. some resources for which we would have had our information there on time. Mm -hmm. uh, quite naturally, I feel very strongly that we would have been in that pool of individuals who who was um, uh, uh, awarded. Yes, sir. but I have. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.
Okay. Um, we're now down to consideration to hold an executive session. Move. Mm -hmm. Hold one uh, second, please. Do we need to discuss the board meeting in July? Okay. Dr. Murray. Uh, well, we were just, uh, the July board meeting, there had been some conversation about, uh, about that. I don't know if we have to discuss it now, but there is a, uh, a board meeting schedule for July 11th, July 11th which is uh, in the midst of mass, and then I think there's some conflicts, and so we were just, uh, I don't know Brown if that was a conversation we need to have tonight or we can have on the 26th by Su July. Superintendent Was it June? Sir? 26th of June. Tw I'm sorry. 26th of June, the, the meeting. We have a, a meeting on the, this month, correct? Oh, you have it there. Okay. okay. All right. Well, we, we'll have that conversation then. Okay. Did I get a motion to consider um, going into exec holding an executive session? So moved. Second been moved and second that we consider holding an executive session. Those in favor? Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. <laughs>